So very uh, quick words of introduction. Uh, first of all, uh, at France Europe, we are very pleased to, to welcome you all to this, uh, to this event today. Uh, to those who are attending this event in person in Geneva and also to all those around the world who are going to join us remotely this afternoon or this morning, depending on the, uh, on the time zone. I'd like, in the names of Friends Europe, to thank all the eminent panelists who are going to participate and intervene today in the discussions, and also the Graduate Institute of Geneva to partner with us and to host this conference in this beautiful premises of Maison de la Paix. I believe this is an important event, not only because it is the 15th anniversary of Friends Europe, but also because it comes at a critical junction time for Global Health and for the Global Fund. Clearly, with COVID-19, the world has ushered into a new Global Health era. It's not the first time. At the creation of the Global Fund 20 years ago, we already experienced a major transformation in the Global Health uh, system and uh, environment, and at that time, with the Global Fund, the international community has devised a sustainable and efficient instrument to tackle the fight against AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. Thanks to the Global Fund, probably the most successful multilateral organization we have nowadays, the results are there. They are fragile and being possibly undermined by the COVID-19 epidemic, but the results are there. Like any period of change, we are facing uncertainties about the new path we have to take, and we need more than ever to share our experiences and thinking. It's time now, certainly, to reconsider the foundations of our global health strategies in light of the recent health crisis. But thanks to the Global Fund, which represents a trove of experience, expertise, knowledge, know-how, we have tools, a toolbox to uh, devise this answer to the new situation. We can build on the lessons learned from the fight against the three diseases, not only to go toward the end of HIV, TB, and malaria, because the fight is not over. There's a lot of work still ahead of us to terminate this, these three pandemics, but also to be better prepared to address future pandemics and health threats. The health crisis has made clear our weaknesses in global health, and probably we have overlooked important changes in the geopolitical sphere underlying the transformation in the global health landscape. Among them, the, global, the increasing multipolarization of the world, the changes in the relationship between North and South countries, a new vision of development aid, the inequality in sharing science and knowledge, and the increased role of uh, civil society organization, private sectors, and philanthropists in global health strategies. But the health crisis has also showed our strengths. And we must build on the strengths of every international organization involved in the global health landscape and it would be certainly a waste of time and money to try to reinvent the wheel. We have instruments in place, including the Global Fund, which is certainly, in my opinion, one of the best. And for this very reason, the Global Fund might be, should be, a driving force of change, for change to design a new global health architecture and to be better prepared to future pandemics without, of course, giving up its main goal to go faster towards the end of HIV, TB, and malaria. Its experience with the fight against the three pandemics, its inclusive multilateral governance, its extensive network of partners, and its responsiveness are key determinants for a better response to future pandemics. It's what we are going to discuss right now, and I wish us a very rich and lively discussions. Now, let me give the floor to Marie-Laure Salle, who is heading this 
fantastic Graduate Institute of Geneva. My Lord, the floor is yours. Merci, cher Laurent. Madame la Ministre, Monsieur le Président du Conseil, cher Laurent, dear colleagues, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a warm welcome to the Graduate Institute. We are very honored to host this event together with Friends of the Global Fund Europe. I, I, am I only, it's only me hearing a, an echo or? It's okay, good. So very honored to be hosting this event together with, uh, uh, with you today at the Maison de la Paix in this beautiful building a conference that is celebrating 15 years of support for the Global Fund. We're particularly happy to welcome you physically, at least some of you phys physically. We, we've been saying that for a few days now. We all are yearning uh, to go back to in-presence conferences and, and debates. So this is really very heartening to see some of you at least in the room, but I'm also obviously welcoming all of uh, you who are joining us through uh, online today. The Global Fund, as it was said, was created in 22 as a powerful collaborative mechanism to fight three of the most devastating epidemics of the last century. It provides the resources and the expertise that affected states and populations need in order to control spread and improve prevention. As such, the Global Fund contributes to positive social and economic dynamics as these devastating epidemics are being brought somewhat under control. The Graduate Institute and the Global Fund have worked together since 2019, enhancing and deploying cooperation between our two institutions, whether it be through research, knowledge sharing, or executive education program. The Graduate Institute, for those of you who don't know us, is a unique voice and actor in the heart of international Geneva. We were born in 1927 in parallel to the early structuring of a multilateral world. As such, world peace is in our DNA. And our early role and early identity was to structure research, training, and expertise that the new multilateral world needed. Peace remains our compass today, but we know that peace will be conditioned in the coming years by our collective capacity to work effectively for a more equitable and a more sustainable world. Health in that context is key. Without significant and rapid progress on the global health front, equity and sustainability and hence peace will remain moot concepts. And in return, without a serious effort at profound and systemic transformation of economic and social dynamics towards more equity, and more sustainability, the types of epidemic risks as the one that we are currently sharing, that, that is currently shaking our world, are bound to multiply. Hence, because of who we are at the Graduate Institute, it makes complete sense that we are co-organizing today this conference, creating in the process a platform to explore the state of the fight against AIDS, TB, and malaria, as has just been said, as well as more generally the prospects for the future of global health governance in the context of COVID-19 and its disastrous consequences. The Global Health Center at the Graduate Institute is naturally a pivotal actor in the in-depth in exploration of global health and its governance with all the political, financial, and di diplomatic issues that are associated. The center, as you know, produces cutting edge research and analysis, exploits its inscription in our transdisciplinary and multi-thematic research environment at the Institute, and naturally also leverages the unique positioning of the Institute in the heart of international Geneva. In coherence with the new charter of the Institute, which was collectively constructed over the last year since I arrived last September, exactly one year ago, the Global Health Center champions open and inclusive governance for global health and the furthering of equity rights and dignity for all. Championing such a vision of global health has never been as necessary as it is today when COVID-19 is testing the limits of global solidarity. 
We've seen over the last year and more our lack of preparedness, weakening multilateralism and inward-looking national and protectionist agendas are creating dangerous obstacles to the proper handling of a global pandemic. The result, unacceptable and highly dangerous global health inequalities is definitely a threat to all of us in many different ways. The effects of COVID-19, arguably the biggest global health crisis in decades, demand that we work towards a reinvented and renewed global cooperation, allowing us to be better prepared to anticipate effectively and respond rapidly to what are bound to be a wide range of threats to global health in coming years and decades as the climate and environmental crisis, but also certain political and economic trends are generating new risks everywhere, every day and everywhere. At the Graduate Institute, we want and we can play an important role in championing such a reinvention, we believe. And I want to take this opportunity to thank and to congratulate all members of the Global Health Center for their important work, underscoring how dense this work has become even more in the last 18 months. A more pointed thank you obviously goes to all of those who have been pre-involved in the preparation of this event today. So again, a very warm welcome to all of you at the Graduate Institute, whether live or online. Congratulations to Friends of the Global Fund Europe for those 15 years uh, threshold. Uh, and I wish all of you rich and fruitful debates. I'm very sorry I won't be able to stay, but I am sure you will have a very rich and interesting debates. Thank you very much. Madame la Ministre, I think that the floor is yours. You see, I took every initiative to come here for the physical meeting. <laughs> I have a pinched nerve, and that is rather painful, but on the other hand, you know, 15 years friends of the Global Fund Europe and 20 years for the, of the Global Fund is worth it to undertake every initiative. So, dear friends, dear colleagues, Ah, and there are some other colleagues coming. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts about 15 years of the Global Fund. I personally joined the organization Friends of the Global Fund Europe a bit later, in 2013. But I consider myself a friend of the Global Fund even longer pretty much since its conception by Kofi Annan and by the G7, G8, where I was privileged to have a role. But let's talk about 15 years. 15 years is long, is enough time for a human being to grow, to play with butterflies, to experience green grass and clouded skies, to learn and to fall in love for the first time. Tragically, millions of children did not get even these first 15 years. The worst killers, malaria, HIV, and TB, took them away from their mothers, fathers, and siblings, often enough, even before they could walk or speak. Just to put one name and one face to these millions of fates, I want you to remember for a few moments Nkosi Johnson. And I see Michelle and, and Christoph, you have been at the uh, AIDS conference in Durban in the year 2000. Nkosi Johnson was one of the speakers at the 13th International AIDS Conference in Durban in the year 2000. And it was in Durban King Park Stadium huge with about 10,000 people in there, and Cozy came on stage with a suit and tie a bit too large for him, 
and he started to speak and he said, Hi, my name is Ngozi Johnson. I live in Melville, Johannesburg, South Africa. I am 11 years old and I have full-blown AIDS. I was born HIV positive. Ngozi talked about his mother, who had already died from HIV AIDS, about stigma that had almost kept him from going to school. 10,000 people in Durban's King Park Stadium hardly dared to breathe. It was heartbreaking. Tabo Mbeki, who had resisted an evidence-based fight against the diseases, left the stadium during the boy's speech. But Nelson Mandela called him an icon of the struggle for life. Yet, Gozi died one year later. He didn't get to the 15. He died age 12. We have come a long way. Six years later, I was fortunate to host together with Angela Merkel and Kofi Annan a successful replenishment for the Global Fund in Berlin. The global response <clears throat> started to pick up and the work of the Global Fund helped that more and more children, not just in South Africa, but also in Western, in Central, in Eastern Africa, in Latin America and Southeast Asia, that more and more children would live to their 15th birthday. Because effective treatment would keep them from contracting the HIV virus from their mothers, because smart bed nets would protect them in their sleep from deadly mosquito bites, and because intact health systems would detect and treat the mycobacterium tuberculosis before it could be passed on to them. And millions <coughs> grew up to play, to learn, and to love. And when I decided in 2013 not to run for re-election in the German Bundestag, it was clear to me that I wanted to continue this struggle because being with friends of the Global Fund has more than one meeting to it, meaning to it. Of course, we are all in this room. We are friends of the Global Fund. But beyond the rational aspect of engaging on behalf of an instrument that is effective for a good cause, I'm so grateful that we are also friends with the Global Fund. We are a group of friends inspiring and learning from each other. I want to thank all my colleagues in our board. Some of them can be here and others will listen to us or look uh, on, online for the invaluable contributions that you are providing. And I want to thank our advisory board for being so brilliant. And some of the colleagues uh, are there also. And I want to give a special Thank to Sylvie Chantereau, who has been the heart and soul of uh, global Friends of the Global Fund Europe. Without you, we wouldn't have existed. Without you, our work would not have been done. And uh, we will miss you terribly as Secretary General, but we're sure you're staying in the fight, and we are very sure that we will always stay in contact. And thank you very much for everything. Thank you. And sometimes it's important that persons are there to take their responsibility. That's it. That's it. It really is our joint engagement, our productive discussions, and our learning as friends that I hope allow us to inspire others, to convince others, to move those who bear the responsibilities today and to make the decisions today. And it is very important to convince governments, European governments, the EU Commission, the European Parliament, to stay on financing and also seeing the Global Fund as, that's my personal position, as an evolving health fund uh, in, in the existing structure that, uh, that we have. Because, and that is needed, why? Why is this work needed? Because on the one hand, far from resisting an evidence-based struggle 
against HIV AIDS, the Republic of South Africa is nowadays buying and even producing large parts of the response to HIV AIDS. But on the other hand, we are also seeing presidents of countries, big and small, who dismiss science and laugh off evidence-based approaches to a deadly pandemic. Kosi Johnson, at one of his last public speeches said, it is sad to see so many sick people. I wish everybody in the world could be well. And today, more than 15 years since his death, it is possible. No one has to die from TB. No one has to die from malaria. No one has to die from HIV AIDS unless we allow it. So let's keep up the fight. Thank you very much. I think I would need some help now <laughs> before I fall. Very much, Heidi Marie, for these words. Greetings, Peter. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're now entering the discussion and the first uh, panel on ending HIV, TB, and malaria by 2030, doing better in the current context. My name is Michel Kazachkin. I'm a former executive director of the Global Fund uh, and it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome uh, a remarkable set of panelists for this discussion, two of them, Christoph Ben and Suri Moon, on the stage, and three of them, Timur Abdullayev, uh, Shannon Haider, and Stephen O'Brien, uh, online. Now, ma'am, let me just say that I'm really, truly pleased and, and thrilled to be part of this celebration of 15 years of Friends of the Fund Europe, 15 remarkable years of Friends of the Fund on the, within the frame, of course, of 20 years of remarkable, super remarkable work of, of the Global Fund. So I'd like to join Heidi Marie in thanking you, Sylvie, uh, in thanking you, Laurent, for your leadership, and also um, special greetings online to our founding chair uh, and first executive director of Friends of the Fund Europe, Michel Barzac. Now, as it's been said, the Global Fund has been and remains a key instrument uh, that has allowed major, extraordinary progress in the fight against HIV, TB, and malaria, but the fight is not over. Sometimes we refer to the few years in between now and 2030 as the unfinished agenda. I don't like this way of addressing uh, what remains a big challenge because somewhere by saying unfinished agenda, it, it may sound that it's simple, let's just do it. We have reasons to think that we can do it. And in the last few years, we've seen more remarkable progress with molecular diagnosis, new therapies, effective new ways of preventing um, TB, HIV. However, and as pointed out by Marie Lorsal, Laurent, and Heidi Marie, we're also facing challenges. Inequalities that we know fuel these epidemics haven't disappeared, some of them have actually increased and, and keep increasing. Multilateralism and the spirit of solidarity and partnership that presided to the foundation, to the creation of the Global Fund is fading and we're facing inward looking nationalism, unilateralism uh, in, in a very complex geopolitical context of, of a multipolar world with a very different distribution of economic and 
uh, political power than uh, in, in years 2000 when the fund was created. And of course, COVID-19 uh, that has become endemic has really shaken uh, the world of global health, questioned our architecture, governance, structured, and unfortunately shown that in 2021, the world is still incapable of delivering the global public goods that, that it needs. So in that context of, of hope and, and challenges, my first question to our panelists will be from where you are, and we have panelists with very different backgrounds. My first question is, from your perspective, uh, where do we go? Uh, will we reach these 2030 targets? What's your view? And let me start with Shannon uh, Hader. Shannon, okay, you're right behind me on the screen. Shannon is the Deputy Executive Director of, of UNAIDS. Shannon, please. Oh, thank you, Michelle, and just thank you to uh, Friends of the Global Fight and to our hosts for um, allowing me to participate. You know, UNAIDS, we stand as huge friends of the Global Fund and find this time, very critical time for our collective future. Um, so on your topic, you know, what are the lessons from our past and present and how does that make me look at what we need to keep in mind as we look towards 2030 and look towards the future? Um, you know, in terms of things that come to the top from lessons we've learned through the HIV fight that have now played out in various ways in the present, in the context of COVID, um, three things come to mind. Um, first is uh, the role of community-led organizations. You know, we have achieved so much in the HIV response over the years by recognizing that organizations of people uh, led by and of people affected by HIV, delivering for people affected by HIV have been critical and transformational. Um, critical in both the decision-making and policy setting, critical in the direct service delivery and reaching communities with what they need, how they need to be reached, and critical, critical in the accountability. Um, Community-led monitoring is what's being promised being delivered. And I point that out because the Global Fund has had a huge role in making sure those elements are part of how Global Fund does business. Um, for example, in the governance and making sure that communities are sitting side by side with uh, 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 state authorities and other responsible parties. So we need to keep that. Um, I'm also bringing it up because we've seen in COVID where there has been a lot of reliance and really heroic efforts by community-led organizations in providing direct services to community at needs of trying to mitigate the effects of COVID and make sure people continue to get as much as possible what they need for HIV and for COVID as well. Yet we have not seen that same access at the decision-making policy-making table. We have not seen that same support for the accountability and the community-led response level. So, you know, we have to keep that in mind as we look forward. Um, similarly, we have seen that the only fully effective response to a pandemic like HIV is one that is rights-based and takes into account inequities and disparities. Um, we've seen under COVID right now, how much inequities and disparities are becoming clear, um, both uh, across countries, but also within countries in terms of who gets access. But we've also seen where under the pressures of COVID, there are specific countries or communities where it's been the opposite of a rights-based response, where the pandemic has been used to further marginalize or persecute or attack um, some of the most marginalized populations already. And that's something we need to keep in mind of not replicating if we're going to get to 2030. Um, third, I think, uh, uh, and I should say on that level, on the um, rights, on the inequities, on the societal enablers, that's where the UNAIDS uh, uh, strategy's new 10-10-10 targets that address uh, societal enablers for decreasing legal barriers, decreasing gender-based violence, uh, and decreasing stigma and discrimination, I think are really important. Um, finally, you know, we've seen in the HIV response, as well as now I think an increasing awareness under COVID where data granularity that is timely and that drives an agile program response 
um, is critical to keeping up and hopefully getting ahead of these kind of HIV or other pandemic responses. Um, so those are lessons to keep in mind. So when I look towards the future in that context, you know, what will it look like if we reach 2030? And I do think we can reach these 2030 goals to end AIDS as a public health crisis and embark on what's next. Um, there are a few things that come to mind. Um, first, you know, I just always have to mention that, um, you know, I think we've gone a little bit too far in how we've sold this idea that HIV is a chronic disease as if it's only a chronic disease. The reality is we have an infectious disease, a pandemic disease that fortunately we have some chronic management for because we don't have a cure and we don't have a vaccine. So we can't end this pandemic in that way. So we need to make sure in 2030, and as we look at the systems that need to sustain in 2030, we're paying attention to both the chronic service elements, but also those pandemic response elements. Can we keep track and see where a new bubble of new infections is, is, is coming up or a community is being increasingly infected so that services and supports can be surged towards that community or that location to keep us from going backwards, to catch things early and provide more services in that context. Um, and it means as we look at 2030, I think there are a few things we can do. Um, one is we have to be aware of myths and misconceptions, right? Um, speaking of, you know, ending AIDS as a public health threat coming from UNAIDS, I encounter a lot of perception that means that, oh, well, if we achieve our 2030 targets, there's nothing left to do. We can just set it and forget it. And it'll just be, you know, whatever is happening with all diseases. I think we will need a more active system than just setting it and forgetting it. I think as a complement to that, we absolutely for sustainability want to see greater, more purposeful integration and, and, and use of the systems that will be there and that are there now. And to do that, I think we really have to work with some of these other um, service constructs and systems to learn from our HIV response and to adopt and integrate some of the things that we do better now. Um, things like uh, integrating new technologies as soon as possible, things like giving virtual delivery or self-management um, approaches or task shifting, or as I would say, and I think this really applies to universal health care and primary health care, making sure that the community-led infrastructure for service delivery is part and parcel of the system, not seen as in competition of traditional facility-based delivery or traditional infrastructure. If we're gonna integrate HIV into primary health care, we need to help make those kind of um, transitions and evolutions of the model together. Um, other examples of this, uh, reproductive health care. Um, we are learning a lot from the whole basis of reproductive health services when it comes to combination prevention. You know, we're starting to talk a lot more about combination HIV prevention as method mix and choice and even how we monitor it. And we learn that from reproductive health service models. Yet when we look in reality in a lot of reproductive health services today, too many of them know that background, but only offer one thing on the ground. There's too many clinics you can go to in Sub-Saharan Africa where you have one choice and one choice only, and that's depot. We have to work together with our partners to evolve and apply those lessons that we know help and, and strengthen those systems together. Um, and Michelle, building on what you said about, um, you know, new diagnostics and molecular diagnostics, you know, I think sexually transmitted diseases are a good example. As we integrate with STI services and other similar services, we need to help go beyond and, and really overcome syndromic only management and really adopt and adapt um, the new diagnostic technologies that make us more effective, more efficient, and, and more direct. And then I think finally, um, especially for the theme of, of today, we have to really um, keep our expectations high. Um, Michelle, you, talk, you started out by talking about how remarkable our achievements together have been. And I would say that that has to do with remarkable expectations as well. You know, we've achieved more than we would have expected 20 years ago, 15 years ago, and that's fantastic. What that means to me is when we look at 2030, we need to plan for transitions and sustainability in terms of not what we have now, but what we're going to need to be at at 2030. Um, all too often, we start transition planning on small things like transitioning who pays 
and we shouldn't be planning on transitioning who pays at a 20% treatment coverage. It's gotta be at that higher 95% treatment coverage so that we're planning for what we want, not what we are right now. Um, so I think those are some of the things that I really think of when I, when I uh, look forward and in this critical time for planning our forward future and this critical moment, I think it's also, we have to have to amplify We've just had a year and a half of the best example that under investing in health, under investing in societal enablers, under investing in these determinants doesn't save us, doesn't save us health outcomes, doesn't save us money, doesn't save our economies when we encounter something new. And so as we go forward, even in this time of economic austerity, we've got to really push for funding what's needed to end the HIV epidemic funding the global fund to do what's needed for HIV, for TB, for malaria, and yes, in this context of COVID and pandemics at the same time. So thanks for uh, giving me a shot. Thanks. Thank you very, very much, uh, Shannon. Um, I'd like now to turn to Sir Stephen O'Brien, former United Nations Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, former uh, Under Secretary of State for International Development in the UK, who throughout his career has always had a, a, a special interest for malaria. I, I remember, Stefan, you even uh, talking about malaria to your constituency somewhere North England. Um, Stefan is a member of the board of Friends of the Global Fund Europe. Uh, Stefan. Well, Michelle, and uh, thank you very much indeed uh, to you and to, uh, uh, to all of you who have made the physical trip to be there. I'm so sorry I can't be with you. As it happens, I am technically isolating as my daughter has COVID. She's uh, doing well, thank you very much. But uh, nonetheless, uh, it's, it's real for us. Um, I, I also just want to say how much it's a pleasure, of course, to... Uh, to appreciate that Peter's in the audience and to thank Laurel for his leadership and Sylvie for all that she's done uh, in the Friends. Uh, but I just also want to mention at the outset how much I identified with the wonderful opening speech of uh, Heidi Marie. Uh, we both come from political backgrounds as well as uh, having a deep passion for progress in global health. And she spoke very much uh, in a way which I identified with and I, I, I'm grateful to her. Uh, on malaria, which I've been interested in since I first as a student leaving Cambridge, having nothing to do with either health or science, I was a lawyer, uh, I went on a trip across the Sahara Desert and we were collecting mosquitoes because my friend, who was a very great scientist, was concerned about the spread of uh, the Anopheles carried uh, falciparum uh, malaria uh, from the, the south of the desert. Uh, and was now appearing in Algiers and places like that. And what had caused that? Well, of course, uh, as is so many, so often the case with global health issues, um, it, if it's not to do with, uh, for instance, the current COVID pandemic, which has got a different uh, profile to it, um, so much of it came out of conflict. In that case, it was the so-called Biafran War had meant that uh, the land transport had replaced the shipping transport for goods to and from Nigeria, which had meant that the Mosquitoes, the vector for malaria, had jumped into the cabs of the lorries and had got themselves all the way over a 10 year period by the time we were there in 1979 uh, to Algiers. So something needed to be done. And there have been so many failures of people trying to eradicate malaria from the early days of thinking that quinine could be the magic bullet, uh, right the way through uh, to the Sri Lankan eradication. And then six months later, because everybody took their foot off the pedal, they thought job done, they didn't need to worry about it anymore. And six months later, people were dying of malaria again in, in Sri Lanka. So you know, there were a lot of pessimistic views about could we ever get rid of malaria? And was it endemic in countries which tended to be, of course, in the tropics and tended to be uh, in those who had the lowest uh, GDPs of the world? So uh, there's no question that the last 20 years and with the friends in complete support of everything the Global Fund has been set up to do and to try and do, and I do salute the creators of the Global Fund. I think it is as visionary and as lasting and as proven its worth as the people who wrote the United Nations Charter 
or the set up the Bretton Woods uh, institutions. I think that uh, uh, they need to be saluted. But we do need to be careful, however much progress we've made, and a lot has been made, uh, that we aren't complacent. Because in many ways, the success is actually our best way of demonstrating the case for more. And uh, in the end, the essential case for malaria, and of course this sits alongside HIV, AIDS, TB, being diseases that we should tackle as global priorities, happen to be health, but they are global priorities in our roles as global citizens, has, if anything, in my view, increased uh, because of that remarkable progress that we've now found a way of being able to put ourselves on a rising trajectory of success to improve human life on Earth. Uh, malaria, which has this distinction of its vector being the mosquito, which is obviously different to transmission between the human race. Um, and it was the, at one point, described as the world's biggest killer that is preventable and treatable, uh, and being very much a disease of the so-called poor, uh, as I say, transmissible by a, another vector themselves, but preying upon a human herd, where, of course, the goal is to get to uh, R, the R number below one, where we have been able to marry a very, very clear view of science and innovation, uh, where we've got uh, very bright people with great experience and techniques who have been engaged and committed, as well as human behaviours which have become self-interestedly incentivised to do the right thing, whether it's living, uh, sleeping under a net or whether it is to get treatment, particularly for uh, under fives and um, pregnant mothers who are the most vulnerable. So uh, malaria has had that profile where it is demonstrably a cause which generates a feeling that this is something we can tackle to generate a, a big public international good. And I thought you put that very well at the outset, uh, Michel. Uh, and it is uh, transformed by the ambition uh, I happened to be in the room uh, in the Intercontinental Hotel in November 2007 when Melinda Gates said that uh, she and Bill wanted to make malaria uh, eradicated in their lifetimes. I'm about the same age, so I'm hoping that we all have very long lives, I have to say. But uh, there was a real sense that uh, we could overcome the pessimism of failed initiatives and disappointments in the past when it came to malaria. But the risks are huge, because whatever progress we make, there is always going to be this massive, massive risk of resurgence of the uh, fast evolving mutations of the mosquito, particularly the Anopheles, and, uh, and with, which carries primarily the, the falciparum uh, parasite, which is the, the worst, and, and also the resistance to therapies and treatments which uh, have come along. And all of them have found themselves expiring in terms of a, an effective tool, whether it's the quinine, sulfaparamides, pyrethroids, uh, increasingly, uh, but now currently Artemisia, which is a fantastic tool, but we have to plan for its eventual demise. Uh, and we've also learned along the way that malaria, there is no magic bullet. You have to have all the tools in the box and you have to flex them according to local contexts uh, to, as Shannon put it very well in relation to HIV AIDS, uh, the strength or lack of strength that you have in community engagement, in the ability to distribute and to reach the hardest to reach and the poorest, and those with the least understanding of what it is that needs to happen and to make sure that the uh, tools that can be used to either treat or prevent uh, can be put in place. So we have, uh, through um, some very successful um, product development partnerships, and I think, again, we need to salute within the malaria world the fantastic engagement uh, and support of the private sector, uh, particularly where they have been prepared to either offer uh, therapies at cost or to make sure distribution is correct and to put a huge amount of investment into things which may not have the usual investment returns uh, and servicing uh, private capital. But we've got uh, great uh, examples in MMV and it remains something of which I'm very humble and very proud of, which is the success of IVCC uh, in, uh, in helping to find new active formulations. And so these are all part of the great innovation the coupling with science and the uh, importance of being able to 
uh, reach communities with the results of these innovative tools uh, that we can help bring down malaria. And the success is there for everybody to see. But behind all this, and this is where I suppose my political background has relevance, and that is that to get the funding at the scale through an instrument of quality, which is going to make sure that it reaches where it needs to be targeted to create the impact, you've got to maintain political support. And particularly on malaria, which is very much a disease of uh, the tropics and, the, uh, and of, of, of many of the poorer countries, uh, getting that political support in countries who have the money, who are prepared to support this international instrument, they need to understand both the impact, the good impact, and also the sustainability. And of course, part of that is a circular argument that the Global Fund, brilliantly set up and has been able to manage its way through the last 20 to 15 years in a tremendous way, uh, has uh, managed to attract a sense of confidence that if the money goes there, it will be at sufficient scale and it will be then properly distributed and value will be created. And above all, that will be regenerated through the replenishment, providing the trust that it is delivering what it says it's going to deliver is, is happening. And that enabled me, for instance, in the UK Parliament, um, carrying it through to some of my UN actions. But also, I know this has been replicated right around uh, many European countries and parts of the caucuses of the United States and so forth, where the political support has been that these public global goods, particularly health goods, where often a disease, and you rightly mentioned, Michelle, that people, I'm speaking from my old constituency area in the northwest of England near Manchester, and uh, of course, nobody here uh, gets malaria or ever has had malaria. And so, of course, this has to be something we have to say, this is worth your while, it's worth your money, uh, making sure that we do this as part of our overall global responsibility for the betterment of everybody. And that political support, therefore, is above party politics, it's for the value of life, and it is very internationalist, and it really respects and uses specialists and, uh, uh, and the scientists. So put all that together, you can't do it without money, you can't do it without trust, and you have to do it with a well-directed uh, intent to reach the impacts, which are then going to demonstrate and help you replenish and maintain the sustainability of it. So if we're looking forward to where we will be in 2030, and what will success look like? It is that we will have ensured that not only do we protect the investment of bringing down deaths from malaria, in sub-Saharan Africa from so something like some between two and three million down to about 480,000 over the last uh, 15 to 20 years. But clearly we've still got another 480,000 to go. And then we have to continue to make the case that to, to lock that in, we need to prevent resurgence, which means that we'll still have to be spending a lot of money on long lasting insecticide treated bed nets and replacing them and indoor residual spraying and making sure new active formulations are coming along, new therapies, new treatments, the vaccines as they take their place in the constellation of tools that can be used and making sure that we understand the differences which are going to arise because of the effect of climate change and the competition with other pandemic and uh, infectious diseases. And so, and I'm, and I'm particularly worried if we get a mutation of the mosquito, which is going to cause serious illness, which becomes a day biter rather than a night biter, because that will put at risk the whole net strategy, which of course is one of the essential elements. So we've got to make sure to keep it on that political agenda that then ensures that the monies will flow because people feel this is a justified cause. But now compared to 20 years ago, we have got the proof of impact, the proof of success. Therefore, they can see in public money terms, this is a great investment. It's also true of the philanthropists will equally support it. And so I would suggest that as we look forward, whether it's innovation, whether it's working with the growth of the tools, uh, putting a huge effort into making sure that we've got the systems to deliver, that we get more and more ownership by communities, that we uh, are careful not to uh, allow the money to be diverted away from treating these three diseases, but actually uh, sometimes can get siphoned off into some of these uh, bigger questions about health systems and so forth, much as it's tempting to think in those terms. And, uh, and there's always a debate about which is the, in, in the UK analogy, the cart and the horse. 
Uh, but that said, I think the more we can double down on the Global Fund, the proven success, this tremendous financial instrument, which has uh, been an outstanding success from its design through to its implementation, from its embryonic stages right the way through to its current mature and delivering uh, proven capability. And I think we should double down on the Global Fund. I think as friends, we have got a lot of uh, continuing contribution to make, to, make, to make the case, make the contribution, and to help create the context of the politics so that people feel really positive about this opportunity to create a continuing great public good. And that will help counter some of the tendencies against uh, multilateralism, which I think uh, Michelle, you made very accurate observations on that. Uh, in this multipolar world, we've got to try and rise above all the differences and uh, disputations. And so I, I will take some persuading that we should grow the global fund to encompass a lot more, I think, sticking to our focus on the three diseases, but using the, the success and the stage we've reached with the global fund for that instrument, for this design to be replicated elsewhere to meet the particular needs of other things. That, you know, I, I know this is a current debate, but if we're talking Stephen, about- Stephen, sorry, I'll we, have to ask you to conclude. Yeah. I, I've, just, I've just concluded, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I, I've gone on a bit. My, my Thank you very much. <laughs> and may I just ask the, the speakers to try and stick to their seven, eight minutes. You know, in the meeting with, with people online and and I can't actually see you, you're behind me. It's, it's very difficult when you chair or moderate an in-person meeting, you can somehow uh, signal, but uh, I can't do that. Um, so let me now turn to uh, Timur Abdullayev, who is um, uh, a member of the Stop TB Partnership, a long uh, time friend, a colleague, and a, um, TB activist and who is joining us from Tashkent, Uzbekistan. Welcome, Timur. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's really nice to be here. And uh, first of all, full disclosure, uh, I'm a person living with HIV. I'm twice a TB survivor, and I would be dead uh, without the Global Fund. So probably multiple times. Um, so I consider myself a friend of the, global of, of the global fund. And uh, uh, that's the stance that I would like to take um, responding to the question that you asked, Michelle. Um, 2030, that's really not far away. And uh, let me say this, if my friend global funds continues the way it works now, we will fail on TB, period we will not be able to end TB by 2030 if the biggest international donor, as the Global Fund is seen, um, does not increase funding for TB. And I will say why I'm saying this. Right now, um, out of the three diseases, TB is accountable for 51, it's as of 2019. Uh, TB was accountable for 51% of deaths out of the three diseases. And if you count uh, TB deaths among people living with HIV, that would actually add 9% more. So uh, it's actually even more than that. But anyway, so, so it's, it, TB is killing, like even, even if you somehow decide not to consider TB deaths among people living with HIV as TB deaths, which is a very interesting approach to take, then even then TB would be accountable for half of the deaths caused by the three diseases. Now, if we look at the global disease split, God bless it, 50% going to HIV, 32% going to malaria, 18% going to TB. Wonderful. Every time we have replenishment going on, what is the first message the Global Fund is putting to the donors. Lives saved. Not infections averted, not diseases cured. It's the lives saved. So if the Global Fund cares so much about lives saved, why then the funding is being distributed not based on mortality, but based on disease burden, 
which is actually, which, which as a concept sucks. And if there are uh, epidemiologists or, or, or doctors in the room, they would probably agree. HIV is not a disease, it's an infection. When it gets to AIDS, it becomes a disease. Tuberculosis is a disease, but if we, if we start looking at the infection burden, because that's how, we, how, how the Global Fund looks, it looks at HIV burden, not at AIDS burden. So if we look at the infection burden, why don't we look at latent TB infection? Why it's, it's active TB disease? There's something fundamentally wrong with the global disease burden and consequently the global disease split, which is how the Global Fund decides how much to give to each of the disease responses. I understand that back in the time when the Global Fund was created, 2002, the situation was dramatically different. And there were way more people dying of, of HIV, malaria, and TB was just one of them. Now TB is the thing competing with COVID. And COVID is actually, you know, they're just saying like, hey, I'm the first now. That's, that's, that's what we have, you know? And, and now the Global Fund is not the biggest donor for, for HIV response globally. For TB, it is, it is. Global Fund is giving most money for TB while it's giving only 18% of the total funding. So uh, my, my question would be, if life saved is what makes the Global Fund and should be, what the Global Fund should be proud of most, why then, when it comes to financing responses, we don't think about lives, we think about diseases. That's, that's the question to everyone. Right now, um, the, the strategic committee is actually going to, to address, it's, it's going to happen very soon, it's going to address whether to keep the current disease split or to change it. And I know it's confidential, at least, no, it's not confidential. It was like not for distribution, but I saw the slide deck prepared by the Global Fund Secretariat to the strategic committee. And let me, let me tell you this. First of all, there are three scenarios, one of which we keep things as are, as they are. We, the second one is we increase the funding for TB if the Global Fund manages to raise more. And then the third, which we increase funding for TB no matter what. But what happens next is on next few slides, the Global Fund Secretariat is saying what kind of disaster it will be for the Secretariat to cope with just one or 2% increase. They think about increased workload. If there are folks, if, if you are in the room, the Global Fund Secretariat folks, well, that's probably not what you should be thinking about first. You should be thinking about how many lives are we going to save? And that does not even appear in that presentation. Wonderful. Good job. Seriously. So I would, I would probably close here and I would just call everyone. If we are friends to the Global Fund, let's tell our friend that it's doing something really wrong. We want to end the three pandemics, the three epidemics by 2030. And believe me, I want HIV to be ended just as much as I want TB ended or malaria ended. I'm allergic to epidemics and to us, you know, having this conversation in 2021, speaking about how we eradicate brainless virus, bacteria, and the parasite. They don't have brains. And, and, and here we are with all our I IQ, I think cumulative IQ of people in this, in this meeting would be thousands. And we are speaking like, are we going to be three things that don't even have brains? Seriously. So my call to you, let's tell our friends that there is a way to end TB by 2030. And, there, and, and it will not actually dramatically worsen things for HIV, for people living with HIV, for people affected by malaria. No, it won't. Believe me, it won't. But we have to do something about it. Right now, TB is killing more than HIV and malaria combined. Thank you very much. Over. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you.
thank you, Timur. Um, and let me now turn to our last two panelists who are here in Geneva on stage um, and who will come with their perspective, uh, a more um, less disease-centered and more, more global. And the first of them is, uh, I'll call first on, on, on you, Suri, if this is okay with you. Suri is the co-director of the Global Health Center here at the Graduate Institute. Let me take this opportunity to thank you again, uh, to thank the Global Health Center and everyone who's worked to help us prepare for this event. And it's really a pleasure uh, for me, uh, Suri, to give you the floor. Thank you so much. Oh, that works. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michelle. And, and because it's the first time I'm taking the floor, I'd just like to echo the thanks from my uh, institute director uh, to Friends of the Global Fund Europe. It's really been a great pleasure to um, co-organize and co-host this event with all of you. Uh, and Michelle has long been a supporter and contributor to the Global Health Center, and that's really been uh, an instrumental bridge, I would say, between our two organizations. And I also want to thank our uh, very hardworking staff, uh, Nora, Elisa, Alessia, Tamam, I see all of you, and I know you've been working tirelessly throughout the month of August while I was on a European-style vacation mm -hmm. uh, to prepare uh, a, a huge amount of hard work that went into preparing for today. Um, I'll try to uh, respect the time limits, and so please do wave wildly at me if I, if I start to um, surpass them. Um, I, I just want to make uh, uh, three points, or to leave you with, with three ideas regarding, you know, wh what do we take away from 20 years uh, of the Global Fund, 15 years of Friends of the Global Fund, um, when we think about the future of global health and, and global health governance and, and the architecture. And the three ideas that I'd like to um, leave you with are first uh, regarding the role of civil society and communities, which has already come up. Uh, the second, the importance of political conflict uh, and the need to sometimes have political conflict. Uh, and the last is um, about whether we are beyond the moment today of big new global funds and what does that mean for the for the architecture so i'll take each of these um, briefly in turn i think one of the most important advances that the global fund um, institutionalized and uh, in many ways spread throughout the global health community was the value put on community engagement starting from the national level with the CCMs uh, all the way up to its own board where you have um, civil society and community representation. And, and this is a norm that was quite uh, radical 20, 25 years ago and has almost become widely accepted, I would say. Certainly much more accepted than it was 25 years ago. And this has really, I think, opened up global health governance. It's made it more inclusive. And it has made what used to be quite um, subversive uh, almost normal. And I think that this is a value that has spread widely, but perhaps not widely enough because we do still see, of course, challenges with uh, having the most affected populations actually at the table and making decisions that affect their own lives. And so there, there's still much more that, that can be done, but I think this is one of the most important contributions that I hope we can, um, that I hope we can sustain. And one of the side effects, one of the most important side effects of this widespread societal buy-in for the mission of the Global Fund is, I think, the financial um, success of the Global Fund. Why is it that uh, donor countries, for example, have repeatedly uh, agreed to replenish uh, the, the fund over many years uh, to, so that it is, in fact, one of the most successful? And I think that widespread societal support has been critical to that. Uh, and that support comes, of course, from the performance of, of the, the fund itself, but also from community mobilization, from civil society mobilization. What we don't have in the global health security world, which is of course now the, you know, the top item on the global health agenda, is precisely that. We don't have a mobilized grassroots community and civil society network that is pushing for sustained investment, for example, in global health preparedness, that is pushing for accountability, that is pushing for a seat at the table. We don't have that yet. And so one of the questions I'd like to put to all of you is how do we combine 
uh, what has been one of the strongest political assets the Global Fund has with the current political moment, um, where there are other issues that I would say are, are higher on the agenda than AIDS, TB, and malaria are today. The second point I want to raise, and, and, and one of the most important legacies in my view of the Global Fund, was um, in taking a, a somewhat subversive stance, and today it sounds kind of normal, but again, 20 years ago, it was, it was not normal for a big international fund to spend donor money on generic versions of patented medicines. And those of you, who, and many of you in the room, and I, I think following online, know this fight very well, and know that it was not easy to um, change norms regarding intellectual property protection, to get more flexibility in those norms, um, to in fact mobilize literally billions of dollars to buy uh, enough doses of medicines to have a massive ramping up of treatment, uh, particularly for, for HIV, of course. And of course, this debate has come back again on the table. Many people are referring to the HIV experience in debates today about access to COVID uh, vaccines and, and treatments. And yet, I have not yet seen that same shift in norms. I have not yet seen that same um, kind of, uh, um, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Perhaps that, that dramatic political conflict and mobilization really um, uh, progressing in the way that we saw 20 years ago with HIV. Of course, the story is not yet over with COVID-19, but I do think that there is a need to challenge accepted rules and to challenge accepted orthodoxy. And this is one of the key things that the Global Fund um, helped to do and to really solidify. And this is one of the things that enabled the progress that we, we see today. Coming now to my, my third point about where are we in this moment, I, I think uh, Michelle and uh, other speakers before you have, have already highlighted that we are in a multipolar moment, whereas when the Global Fund was created, we were very much in a unipolar moment, uh, an American unipolar moment, kind of the, the long end of the post-Cold War era when there was also, I think, much more appetite for big global goals. This was the beginning of the MDG era, and there was an appetite for big, uh, grand global plans, global funds, global goals, to the extent that arguably we don't see today. And the challenges are no less urgent. I don't have to remind all of you of, of what those challenges are. But I do think we have to be a bit clear-eyed and realistic in what does it mean to live in a multipolar world. And I think one of the things it might mean, and perhaps this is an unpopular thing to say at an event celebrating the Global Fund, but one of the things it might mean is that Appetites for big global funds are not what they were 20 years ago. What it might mean is that we will have a more fragmented, more complex, more um, crowded uh, ecosystem than we used to have with regional initiatives um, also on the stage next to global initiatives. What I hope is that that kind of outcome does not deflate the ambition. What I hope is that we find ways to all work with each other uh, and that the fact that there are maybe many more initiatives and organizations doesn't mean we have to be any less ambitious than we were 20 years ago. And that some of the key, what I hope is that some of the key ideas and values that I think the Global Fund has embodied, has institutionalized and has spread Again, regarding civil society and community engagement, regarding transparency, regarding inclusiveness, regarding human rights. I hope those ideas will spread to many, many other initiatives that I do believe will be created in the, in the years to come. And to conclude, I'm not sure we will meet the 2030 goals regarding the three diseases in letter. I'm not sure that we will meet what are very ambitious uh, quantitative targets. I hope we do, um, but I'm not sure we will. And so if we don't do that, what I hope we can do is meet those goals in spirit. And the spirit, I think, that drove the creation of the Global Fund, and I hope will drive the creation of future global health initiatives, is very much a spirit of health equity, of equality, of uh, addressing and not leaving behind the most marginalized groups. And if that spirit can infuse a push towards 2030. If we have more health equity in the world in 2030, partly as a result of the work of the Global Fund, I think we will have achieved quite a great deal. Thank you very much, Suri. Lots of um, food for thought. 
Um, let me now turn to our uh, last speaker in this panel, um, Christoph Ben, who is currently Director for Global Health Diplomacy at the Jupp Lange uh, Institute in, in Amsterdam. But Christoph, as all of you, many of you would know, has been with the Global Fund from day one until recently and for a long, long time has been the Director of External Relations. And I had the, the privilege and the pleasure to, to work with Christoph all through the seven years of my Global Fund tenure. So, Christoph, it's a pleasure to give you the floor. Thank you very much, Michel, and um, thank you for the kind words. And you can all imagine that um, it's quite special for me to celebrate with all of you here 15 years of Friends of the Global Fund Europe, because I really think it has been an extraordinary success. And the Global Fund wouldn't be where it is without Friends of the Global Fund Europe nor would all the respective replenishments have been as successful as they have been without the amazing support of friends of the Global Fund Europe, and therefore also allow me to express a special thanks to you, Sylvie, for your incredible leadership over these 15 years and for 15 years of very nice and very close collaboration. I really appreciated that. And um, <laughs> I hope that Michelle Bazak is listening. She was mentioned before, and obviously she was critical for the establishment of Friends of the Global Fund Europe um, in 2006, and a lot of you know, um, acknowledgement also to, to Michelle for, for her leadership um, and to all of you who've made Friends what it is. But enough looking at the history of Friends Europe and now looking forward. And uh, the seventh replenishment of the Global Fund is coming up. And I dare to say that, once again, you know, friends of the Global Fund Europe will play a very critical role. And if that replenishment is going to be successful, it will not be without Friends Europe and what they can do, as they did in the sixth replenishment um, under the leadership of France and the hosting of, of France. So um, I think this will be a very important element. Coming now to the question of the panel. How will we achieve the original goal of the Global Fund to end AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria by 2030? And I add the, the very important words as public health threats. We are not talking about you know, elimination or eradication here. I think that's important to, to note. But the goal to, to end as public health threats, and that will be difficult enough. And we know that the current COVID you know, pandemic has made those goals even much more difficult to achieve. But I would dare to say that um, among all the instruments and all the international organizations, all the programs around the world that have suffered so much under the current pandemic, I do believe there is evidence that the Global Fund and its unique model has probably proven to be quite resilient in protecting the gains and also continuing to provide services to those people who need access to prevention, care and treatment. I know we are waiting for the uh, results coming out, the results report with more details about, you know, how exactly has been the effect of that. Um, and I know that there has been effect, particularly on TV, actually, Timur, I would, uh, you know, acknowledge that. But nevertheless, I believe, you know, that there's probably evidence to say um, the Global Fund has been holding up pretty amazingly in this period. And that means that many of the original principles and the design features of the Global Fund have proven to be extremely effective, even in this very particular situation. Many of those have been mentioned by you, the inclusive governance, you know, including civil society, for example, multi-stakeholder partnership, the relentless focus on results, the defense of human rights and addressing barriers to access questions, and the community empowerment and participation that has been at the heart of the Global Fund from the beginning and is proving again very important for the COVID response. I would add one element that I think has been missing and that we did not have 20 years ago at the creation of the Global Fund or 15 years ago at the creation of Friends. This is for the Global Fund to fully make use of the digital transformation. Um, and I do believe if we want to achieve those goals by 2030, the Global Fund needs to maximize the opportunities that present themselves um, to reach populations, to make the programs much more efficient, accountable. Um, that's a huge opportunity, particularly, I believe, in the you know, poorest uh, countries and the most vulnerable uh, populations. And there are many factors that are currently slowing down progress towards those goals. 
digital transformation, I think, is one of the few elements where we can say this could be an accelerator um, to, in the years to come, and I wish that the Global Fund will fully take this opportunity. Now, as mentioned before, all eyes are probably on the seventh replenishment. And in the Global Fund, we've always said the next replenishment will be the most difficult. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and That's it has true. been more or less a cliche. And I actually think it has never been true. But it's always, you know, good to say, you know, that's the, that's the most difficult. However, what we do know for sure is that the next replenishment will be the first after the onset of the COVID pandemic. And it will have a tremendous, you know, impact on the replenishment and how it can be run. So I think, you know, we, we have to look at that um, if we are considering also the, the future role of, of friends of the Global Fund. Um, and therefore, my you know, last point, uh, you know, in this kind of debate um, is if we look at the upcoming strategy of the Global Fund, I know, you know, many of you and the Secretary, the Board and so on, you're, you're looking at the next strategy. What I hear is there is, of course, a fierce debate about, you know, what should the Global Fund really do? Should it focus more or less exclusively on the three diseases or should it rather look at the, at the bigger picture? You know, I don't know, you mentioned the Global Health Fund that, you know, we have been debating Michelle as well, you know, many years ago and for, for many years you mentioned also, you know, what does it mean kind of to talk about uh, the Global Fund in this current context? Also, as many important reports and politicians are discussing, should there be a pandemic preparedness, you know, financing facility? Should there be a Global Health Threats Fund? So the Global Fund has to position itself in this context. And my advice would be that don't take, you know, strong focus on the three diseases or positioning the Global Fund in this context as being in opposition to each other. I deeply believe that if the Global Fund wants to be successful in the seventh replenishment, it will be exactly because the Global Fund will and has to look at how can it make itself relevant in this context? How can it demonstrate that all these principles, all that has been achieved will be just as relevant for the world to overcome this pandemic and prepare for future ones. So by neglecting that, it will not only be a huge missed opportunity, because I think we, we need this role of the Global Fund, but even I dare to say it would not serve the purpose of ending those three diseases by 2030, because maximizing the, the resources for the Global Fund and the seventh replenishment will probably only be through positioning the Global Fund in the wider context, and then the fight against the three diseases will definitely benefit from that. So um, that, I think, you know, is something that, that I believe the Global Fund should look at, not neglecting, of course, the core mandate of the three diseases, but then looking at how does the Global Fund, you know, support efforts for, you know, pandemic preparedness and response, how does the Global Fund invest in resilient health systems that are required for this response? And I would argue particularly at the primary health care level. Um, that's, I think, where the Global Fund can make the biggest you know, difference and also where the digital transformation can have its biggest impact. So this is not in contradiction to the three diseases, but I, for me it's a prerequisite so that donors will maintain this confidence and will allocate the resources required you know, for the seventh replenishment. I know, Peter, that you and your team, you know, you are, you're working on that and, and you know, um, you probably share a lot of that. But speaking now for friends of the Global Fund Europe and speaking as a board member, I think this is something that we as board members of friends can do to support you in that, you know, in this discussion and in positioning the, the Global Fund um, and to back you up uh, in that because I think um, it is a very important um, debate. And, but, if we can, you know, position the Global Fund as a critical element in this kind of pandemic response, I am deeply convinced we are not only serving, you know, people affected by AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria better, but it will also be a very important uh, signal to the world. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Christoph. I, I wish we, we would have time for a, a, a debate, answers and qu questions and answers from the audience, but we're 
bit late on our program. There are people online. We have to do our best to respect the schedule. So I'd just like to thank all of our speakers, uh, Shannon, uh, Timur, Stefan, Suri, uh, Christoph. I'm sure, uh, Peter, um, you will address some of the issues raised in, in your remarks. Um, so thank you to all, and it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, the Executive Director of the Global Fund, Peter Sands. Thanks, Michelle. And, and to start with, uh, I'd like to thank the Global Health Center and the Graduate Institute um, for hosting us. Um, I don't know what this is for everybody else, but this is my, my first kind of big um, public event since the onset of uh, COVID. Um, but above all, I want to thank the Friends of Global Fund Europe. And I confess I feel uh, a bit humbled to be with so many people who have given so much energy, so many years of their lives in the fight against HIV, TB, and malaria. I have two of my predecessors. <laughs> Mark was online. I, I, I don't know whether he's lost, but Michelle. Uh, we have people like Heidi, like Laurent, like Michelle Bazak, who created the Friends. Sylvie, who has shown such amazing persistence and determination. And so many other friends, participants, board members, advisory members, who have given so much. All I can say is we are going to need you now. Because although we have made huge progress, this is an, an extraordinary challenging moment uh, for the Global Fund. Christoph mentioned the results report, which will come out next week. And it is true that I think the Global Fund partnership actually reacted extraordinarily effectively, innovating, working together, different ways of distributing bed nets, different ways of uh, ensuring continuity of treatment for TB, multi-month dispensing, much greater use of self-testing, all sorts of innovations that have been kind of proceeding got accelerated and moved faster. And that did actually protect many of the gains, but not all. We, and it, I suppose the test shouldn't be how, back, how far backwards did we avoid going. It's more that we didn't make the progress that we needed to make to get on track for 2030. The other big challenge, actually, for the Global Fund and for the fight against HIV, TB, and malaria is what... COVID has done to global priorities and the shape of the debate around global health. We can have all sorts of fun discussions about the disease split, and thank you, Tamar, for bringing that in. But the reality is that isn't the big picture. The big picture is that we run the risk of a huge chunk of global resources going into fighting COVID. It has already. That's been the thing that has drained a lot of money away from HIV, TB, and particularly TB and malaria. And also that the world will rightly want to invest more on protecting against future pathogens. And if we're not careful, and if we don't position HIV, TB, and malaria within that swirling debate, which is very live right this moment. G20 health ministers are meeting in Rome this weekend. 
we run the risk of HIV, TB, and malaria becoming a kind of large versions of neglected tropical diseases. That would not get us to 2030. It would be a recipe for never getting to our 2030 goals. And so we have to become part of that debate. We have to become part of this discussion around how does the world make it safer, itself safer, and make everyone safer from the deadliest infectious diseases. I noted Shannon used the word pandemic to describe HIV. We cannot allow pandemic to be a term that is only used when it's a disease that does or might kill people in rich countries. We cannot allow these diseases to be reclassified as sort of epidemics or endemics, endemic diseases, when they stop killing people in rich countries, which has tended to be what the world has done. We need to sort of reassert the fact that TB, for example, is a pandemic. So many of the people in the world, as Timo has rightly stressed, have, lit have latent TB. If we're going to have a discussion about dealing with pandemics, absolutely diseases like TB have to be part of that discussion. If we end up with a definition of pandemic preparedness where the implicit definition of pandemics is footnote, things that might kill people in rich countries, then pandemic preparedness is inherently inequitable. And this is a, a debate, a, an argument we have to win. Because if we care about, as we all do, the people who are suffering from, threatened by HIV, TB, and malaria, and who, let's face it, are often the same people who are most threatened by diseases like COVID, we have to ensure that the way the world thinks about protecting people from infectious disease threats is inclusive, does include the most marginalized communities, and doesn't have a short memory and only thinks about the next thing around the corner. And this is going to be um, a very live challenge for us all, um, for the Global Fund Secretariat, but also for you and friends next year in 2022. As Christoph rightly reminds us, we always think of the next replenishment as being the most difficult one we've ever had. Um, I would actually say I do think this one is the most complex. Um, because next year, we are going to face three very live, simultaneous, infectious disease-related claims on, in a sense, global resources. We're going to have the Global Fund replenishment. And any calculation, and we're doing the investment case right now, but you don't need to do the math to know the answer. You just look at it. We haven't made as much progress. 2030 hasn't moved, so the trajectory has to be steeper. Domestic resources for most of our diseases, but particularly TB, have been diverted. The ask has to be for more. The need is going to be greater. If we want to have a realistic aspiration of ending HIV, TB, and malaria as a epidemics, as pandemics, then we need more money. But simultaneously, we have to be very realistic. COVID-19 is not going to be solved this year. In fact, it's touch and go whether we're winning or losing right now. There will be a very, very significant ask need to continue to respond to COVID-19 um, next year. And we have to be very careful about positioning ourselves in competition because it is the same, the most vulnerable people in the world, the poorest communities, who are increasingly the people who are dying. And forget the published numbers. You can, <laughs> particularly in the poorest places, the numbers on infections and deaths bear no resemblance um, to what is actually happening. And, and we need to recognize that what is happening is a catastrophe on, on 
any measure. Even the recorded numbers are looking at four and a half million deaths in the last 12 months. And the, the true numbers would be double, triple um, that. So there's going to be a big requirement for funding the next phase of the COVID-19 response. And then, as you all know, there are also big asks for you know, the high-level panel for pandemic preparedness. I've forgotten quite what its title was. Um, is asking for 10 billion a year for pandemic preparedness. We can't have these three things sort of in an unmanaged competition because otherwise I think it'll get very messy and I worry that with the enthusiasm of politicians often for the newest and sort of most immediate thing that our diseases could lose out. And the Global Fund has a role to play actually across all three of these things. Um, we obviously have a huge role to play on HIV, TB, and malaria, and that is our mission. We are playing a significant role. We are, at the moment, the largest provider of support to low- and middle-income countries on the non-vaccine elements of the COVID response. And almost, whether we like it or not, we are a very significant player in helping countries with their pandemic preparedness because intrinsically by the nature of what we do to fight infectious diseases, we're putting in place capacities and infrastructure to do that. So I think one of the things, and I'm not going to, um, uh, I'm conscious we're already running late, um, uh, try and solve this conundrum, but I want to put it out there and maybe the next panel can solve it for us, um, uh, is we have to find a way of crafting an overarching narrative that links these different things, which are definitely going to happen and definitely going to be there, and places what the Global Fund does and the imperative of continuing to make progress on HIV, TB, and malaria in that broader agenda. I think if we fail to do that, and Christoph, I think you were sort of going in the same direction, if we fail to place it in that broader agenda, we will have an extremely difficult time because that broader agenda is going to be there and is going to be what the G20 and G7 are going to be talking about. So between us, friends, the Secretary at the board, all the stakeholders of the Global Fund are going to have to crack this one. And it is going to require us to think, I think, quite boldly about the way we think about the Global Fund, not because we, we want to divert from HIV, TB, and malaria, but because if we're serious about achieving our objectives on HIV, TB, and malaria, we have to embrace the reality that we face. With that, again, huge thanks to all of you for the fantastic support, leadership you've provided over so many years, and a big kind of thank you in advance for all the support we'll be drawing on you for next year. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, for this uh, heartening and challenging world that uh, now a perfect and provides a perfect introduction to our next panel, which is going to be devoted to meeting the challenges for a world better prepared to future pandemics. So contrary to the first panels, so most of our panelists are going to be online, including our moderator. So I may invite to connect and switch on the mic, uh, Erika Castellanos, who is the Director of Program at GATE, Member of Communities Delegation of the Global Fund Board, who's going to be the moderator of this panel. 
Mark Dybel. Hello, Mark. Everybody knows him, a former executive director of the Global Fund, who is now working at Georgetown mm. University Medical School. It's going to be also remotely, unfortunately. Sarah Hawkes, director of the Center for Gender and Global Health. Martin McKee, and Martin, if you can join on. You're going to be alone, but I'm going to, 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 to be with you to, to support you. And uh, Precious Matsoso, everybody knows Precious. She has been, uh, she has a very, very impressive uh, career, both in South Africa and at the WHO. Now she's an uh, honorary lecturer at the Department of Pharmacy and Pharmacology at the University of Witwatersrand. I don't know if I'm pronounced that right. And Stefano Vella, a member of the board of Friends Europe, a young professor of global health, who is unfortunately in Rome, but is always with our, in art with us. So let's start. And uh, Erika, now it's your turn and your job. Please. Thank you very much. And thank you for all the panelists uh, joining us. It's not always an easy task when there's such an uh, interesting conversation and amazing panelists, but you also have to try to come back uh, to, uh, in tracking time uh, and uh, cut some time. So I'm going to ask our panelists to be very brief, as, as brief as possible in their interventions. You know, we all know COVID-19 has disrupted our lives and our work and has impacted HIV, TB and malaria response. Health systems across the globe have been severely stressed. The inequity in the access to vaccine, in addition to vaccine hesitancy, has stood in the way towards our response to COVID. And I want to start the conversations by asking all of our panelists um, to share their views and where we are and what is needed in, uh, in order to meet the challenges for a world better prepared for future pandemics. And I'm going to start with Sara, if you can share it with us. Yes, good afternoon. I hope you can hear me. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation to, to speak with, um, with all of you this afternoon and to, to learn from, from all of you. Um, I was introduced as being the uh, director of Sarah, I'm not sure Sarah, if it's only we me, cannot, but we uh, cannot hear you. I, mm, I'm not sure. You can hear you now. You can hear me now. You can hear me now? Sarah, we cannot hear you. Might turn off your video and. and I would keep. Ara, we can, we still cannot hear you. And meanwhile, you. Meanwhile, you. You saw. You saw. Can, can you hear me if I speak now without a video? Yes. Yes. Oh, there you go. You can't have to. <laughs> we, we just heard something about the power of digital technologies, but I feel fear that there's still a way to go. Um, so I'm I'm speaking right now as a co-director of Global Health 5050, which is uh, an, an, an organization that we set up a few years ago to look at the issue of gender equality in the global health system. And the reason I'm talking to you about Global Health 5050 is that two years ago in January 2020, in preparation for our annual report, we wrote a, a, a report that, that essentially focused on what we called the broken system of global health. And I've just been rereading that report and thinking about what does that mean um, for, for the future and looking at are the kind of evidence that we found to, to, to conclude that what we were looking at was a broken system. 
and remembering that this is pre-pandemic. This is two months before the UK, for example, went into lockdown, and it was as, as first reports of COVID was, were starting to emerge. And the reason that, that we concluded that in 2020, we were looking at a broken global health system was that first of all, we weren't convinced that there was such a, a thing as a real global health system per se. What we saw instead was a series of um, relatively uncoordinated organizations that some, of, some parts of, of the system are well coordinated, they're well networked, they're well financed, but in general, many of the actors and, and institutions and organisations involved in global health are not coordinated in any formal sense of, of, of the word. For the 150 organisations that we included in, in our review in 2020, which includes many of the main parts of, of the global health um, architecture that Swery Moon uh, referred to earlier, what we found was that even in 2020, the, the vast majority of those organisations were still working on an MDG agenda. They had not moved on to the era of the SDGs. The vast, the predominant focus, the areas of activity, and I realise that this, this won't be a necessarily a pa palatable thing to hear for the Global Fund, but for example, 65% of organisations were working on infectious diseases, but only 10% of organisations were working on issues such as tobacco and alcohol. And what we found across the board was that there, were, there was almost no action at all on the underlying determinants of ill health. We complemented that with a review on the, of the communiques of the G7, the G20s, the BRICS, and the, the candidates for the WHO Director Generalship a couple of years earlier, and found that any conversation or, or commitments to action on determinants of ill health were essentially lacking. Instead, there, there continued to be a focus on treatment, on health systems, and as I say, particularly on health systems and treatments um, relevant for, for MDG era goals and problems. We tried to think about why we were seeing such, such a picture across these 150 organisations when we looked at them in 2020. And I think, you know, there, there's, there's probably a number of reasons that, that underlie the picture that we saw and provide a, a, a set of reflections for moving forward. Lying at the, the uh, underlying the entire picture, of course, are politics, power and history, particularly the history of what has come to be called the global health system, a history that is rooted in imbalances of power and privilege. We know that there are problems with institutional path dependency. We know that the current system that we see stays, um, it suffers from stasis due to threats to vested interest, interests. And finally, what we saw when we looked at who was actually running the system is that there is a non-representative group of a narrow demographic that sits at the top of what is called the global health system. So our final conclusion is that we need it, this was back in 2020, is that equality in the current global health architecture is not enough to call for. What we need is a radical transformation of what we're calling the global health system. We need a system that is based on principles of human rights, i.e. transparency, accountability, equality and equity. We know that the Global Fund came into being at a moment of, as a moment of radical transformation. And we think, 18 months after we wrote our last report, that COVID represents an equally um, opportune moment for radical transformation. 
It's a window of opportunity for change, but one of the things that, that we think needs to be um, emphasised at this particular moment is ensuring that that, that that opportunity for change is open to everybody equally and equitably. This is not the moment for the same players and people to start designing the new system. This is a moment for a system that takes everybody's voice into account to be transformational for the health of everybody. Thank you. Ara, Ara, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very, very much. much. Uh, we're going to move on quickly to Precious. Precious, what are your thoughts on meeting the challenges for a world better prepared for future pandemic in five minutes or less? Well, in, in five minutes, thank you very much. I would like that, uh, yes, there is consensus that the world fail to prepare, we're tardy in response, we've become more unequal, and inequities have been laid bare. But we could have learned from the HIV experience. Learned because from what you said and from my experience, having worked in a country where we started with denialism, which led to tardiness, we're able to ramp up and put a whole lot of people on treatment. But we also have not learned that even at that time, people did not have access to medicines. But again, we're still debating the same issues about access to vaccines and inequities. So what I would like to recommend is that firstly, let's recognize that global health security and pandemic preparedness are not only the business of health. It is everybody's business we need one health approach, but we also have to recognize that preparedness has been grossly underfunded. And these investments are not a cost, it's a necessary investment. And the debate and discussions about investment in health systems have been going on for years. We, we heard today again, we've seen it again with the pandemic, the COVID experience. So the question is, why are we not doing it? Why do we fail to invest at country levels in health systems? But at a global level, I would ask, it is necessary and expedient that we improve coordination but we also learn from the experience of the Global Fund about its periodic reviews, assessments, monitoring and evaluation. My view is that we don't have to reinvent the world. Let's build on those systems that already exist and see how best they can be supportive of our pandemic preparedness and response. But for as long as we do not have inclusive structures that take into account the experience of communities on the ground who would have failed. Pandemic starts in communities and they end in communities. And our failure to recognize this invaluable resource, I think it's unfortunate because we've seen in our HIV AIDS response how communities have been central. And I can talk about the South African experience, but I can also talk globally about how best we're able to respond. So finally, I'd like to say that when we respond this time around, we must not follow a piecemeal approach where we cherry pick. We need a comprehensive response of an essential package of these recommendations that have been made upfront. So when we cherry pick, we'll be back again as to where we are today. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to prepare better by ensuring that there's synergy between communication, information sharing, as well as epidemic surveillance. So we can't do one and leave out the other and take advantage of digital tools and platforms that we've seen in development over the past 18 months. And let's yes. maximally use them. Thank and you I very think much, that. Precious. Thank you very much. Mark, over to you. 
Thank you. Um, uh, and just to really acknowledge Laura and Sylvie and all of the friends. Um, great to be with all of you. Sorry I can't be there in person. And of course, Shell and Peter um, being sandwiched between them as, as former executive director, unfortunately shows all my inadequacies as I'm sure my comments will compared to theirs. Um, you know, in, the, in that regard, Peter mentioned, we're not sure if we're winning or losing. I would say definitively we are losing uh, the battle against COVID. Um, the vaccination rates in Africa, one to 3% um, because of gross inequality. And now, as we could have predicted in immunological inevitability, uh, mu has emerged, which looks like it could be resistant to existing vaccines. And if mu is not, uh, the next one will, or the next one after that. So next year is going to be not a good year. Um, we probably will need new vaccines and start all over again. And we don't have any effective treatments. So um, that will be the context, I think, in which the Global Fund uh, is existing, but also is trying to go through a replenishment. Uh, what's needed, uh, Precious, Michelle and I were all part of IPPR, um, the G20 high level panel and legislation on both houses of the US have all called for basically similar structures. You need a governance structure and you need a financing structure. On the governance side, you know, we need something at the head of state level internationally linked to regional and national and subnational responses. Um, without that governance, we're not gonna get anywhere. Uh, if, if the heads of state don't engage, if the upcoming General Assembly and the G20 doesn't engage in a substantial way and involve all regions, not just the rich countries, uh, we're not going to get anywhere. Um, the Global Fund is not the right governance structure for that. However, the second thing that I'll call for is a financing mechanism. And there, um, we need to look seriously at what the options are. I'll just pick up on two things related to finance that are important, um, at least in my view. One precious hit on is absolutely essential. Communities have to be involved from the beginning. Uh, it's the only way we responded effectively against HIV, and it's the only way we'll ever respond effectively against anything. If you can't get to the communities, if you can't get people vaccinated, if you can't get prevention and preparedness at the community level, we will have more and more pandemics. The second thing uh, is a sustainable governance and financing structure. And if we're going to be ready for the next pandemic, the most sustainable way to keep those systems going is to use the resources in between new global catastrophic pandemics for existing pandemics like HIV, TB, and malaria, and intentionally build those systems to have the preparedness, uh, the, the surveillance, and the surge capacity when there's an emergent threat. Uh, and there, of course, the Global Fund and other health institutions are very important. My own view is that the best of all the bad alternatives is the Global Fund as the financing mechanism, uh, because the Global Fund has all of those things and has proven has a proven track record because we can't build something new. And the reality is nothing ever coordinates in our systems. So if we build something new, the notion that it's going to coordinate is just fantasy. I'd like one demonstration of proof that we've ever succeeded in coordination across institutions. So um, it's going to be a tough haul. Uh, I have no doubt this group and everyone attached with it will do a great job. But if I would just caution that I understand the concern that that being more engaged in in uh, pandemics more broadly could be harmful to HIV, TB and malaria financing and, and focus. I would just say that if you are not engaged, deeply engaged in pandemics, there is no way you're not going to lose focus and money and it is inevitable that HIV, TB and malaria would suffer. And with that, I'll leave it back to you. Thank you very much, Mark, for sharing uh, those. Um, Martin, uh, what is your take around meeting the challenges um, for a better world, more prepared? Well, thank you very much for asking. It's something that uh, I've been thinking quite a lot of in the last few months because um, I've been stuck as the uh, pen holder on another report that will be launched next Friday, chaired by Mario Monti. It's the Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development. And uh, 
I wish I could tell you what the title is. I have to say we've spent almost as much time discussing the title as we did the content of the report. And um, in fact, uh, you may have seen me look at my mobile phone once or twice during the presentations because that was when we were trying to finalize it. But anyway, it will have a very lengthy evidence review um, which I had the privilege to pull together, which um, Michelle, in fact, has already seen, and uh, will we'll address some of these things. I want to pick up three points, like Suri, because uh, I know time is short. And I think the, the first point I'd make is that we actually have had three global crises, at least, uh, maybe more, in the 21st century. September the 11th, 2001, the global financial crisis, and COVID. I think it's pretty clear that we made a mess out of the first one, the aftermath of September the 11th, the war on terror. We have all watched with horror the scenes from Kabul over the last few days. And clearly we got that one wrong and we continue to get it wrong. Now the global financial crisis we also got wrong in many ways, but actually there were some things that came out of that that were positive, the G20. One of the things that impressed us has been the Financial Stability Board that was put together by the G20. And it's one that we have drawn inspiration from. Because when we went into the COVID pandemic, we could easily have had another financial crisis, a crisis of liquidity, but the central bank stepped in and they prevented that from happening. I mean, it's been bad enough economically and in every other way in the pandemic, but it could have been an awful lot worse. So we've been motivated to look at that model and to look at the way that the G20 in particular functioned at that time as an inspiration for how we might go forward bringing together the finance ministers because, and the health ministers and the others. Because clearly the finance ministries and the international financial institutions now get it. The argument that you should not invest in health because it's just a drain on resources is no longer tenable because we now can see very clearly that if you fail to invest in health, then you will pay for it, pay more, many times more in the long run. Now, the second point I want to make is that the solutions are not just technical. And here is something, again, the Global Fund has demonstrated this, but it's a lesson that we need to keep on learning. If the solution to the problems we face were simply technical, then looking at the Global Health Security Index, the two countries that should have done best during the pandemic were the United States and the country that I live in, the United Kingdom, as they came first and second on that index. It's pretty clear that they did not. In fact, apart from the initial stages of the vaccine rollout, it's rather difficult to see anything that the country that I live in did right. So leaving, so we clearly need to look beyond the technical and we need to find out where the problems lie. Now, an analogy that we have used, Sandro Galea, myself and others, was to look at a country going through a pandemic as being like a ship in a storm. It may have all the technical gear on board, the best satellite navigation system, the best control systems, but if it has a captain who is asleep at the wheel, who has no understanding of how to steer a ship, who is sorting out his personal matters, missing meetings when he should be at them, then we have a problem. And if we have a ship whose crew is not there, and when in the middle of a pandemic, we need to go to a recruitment agency to find the crew, to bring them together, to train them to work together, to get them to speak the same language, to show them where the equipment is, we have a problem. And if the ships are not well maintained and the planks are adrift, if the safety nets are torn, and if people are falling through the gaps either in the ship or the social safety nets that we have uh, in our societies, then we will have a problem. So we need to look beyond the technical. And as others have said, we need to understand the reality for the people who are affected. 
One of the books I'm reading at the minute is called Anthrovision by Gillian Tett, a Financial Times uh, journalist who started off life working in a country that I know, Tajikistan, as an anthropologist looking at marriage rituals. And she has brought her anthropological skills to bear on the global financial crisis as one of the first to note that many of the financial instruments that led to the crisis, simply nobody understood them. And she has brought it to bear on, on pandemics as well. And I think we need to work, as we and others have argued elsewhere, with co-production, working with people to find solutions. Too often, our search for the science misses out the reality of people's lived experience. And the third point I make, and you will read more about this in our report, is that we need a new model of health. And I have to say I'm particularly pleased with this one because it's one that we've, I think will be helpful in, in moving forward. At its centre, we have one health, the health of humans, of animals, of the natural environment, all living in a sea of microorganisms interacting with one another. And there are a whole series of things that make health better. The Ottawa Charter set them out, peace, the absence of war, um, food, nutrition, shelter, but many other things that we have ignored. Access to justice, access to the digital environment, education, and so on. But there are also factors that make health worse, that undermine our responses. And they, of course, are things like conflict and so on, the commercial determinants of health. The things that we don't talk about, corruption, we have seen a massive problem, not, I mean, maybe in poor countries, but we look at the procurement of PPE in some rich countries. And again, I would point you to a report I recently was the rapporteur on for the European Commission on public procurement, which looks at this, and I'm afraid one country that is no longer a member of the European <laughs> Union does not come out very well from that report. <laughs> All wrapped up in planetary health. So there are th those three issues. We need to learn from previous crises. We need to look beyond the technical solutions and we need to have a new model of health. And with those, I think that we can move forward in a better position than in the past. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. I am sure that there are many people that were taking notes while you were speaking. Um, so with that, I'm gonna move to Stefano to look at your views. Hello. Hi, friends. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm, you know, I'm very much a good friend of the Global Fund. I was in Durban when the idea started. And um, I would like to link to what um, has been said, first of all, by uh, my big friend, Mark Geibel. Um, definitely, we are not winning this, this, this war. And this is what I'm trying to repeat to my friends working on, on the G20 aspects. Uh, uh, the problem is today and now, of course, we need to prevent the future ones. Um, I saw yesterday, I had a call with this uh, researcher from the Viron project that says that there are like, I don't know, 12,000 viruses around. And this comes to the issue of One Health. 12,000 animal viruses that could spill over. Uh, anyway, I think that the problem is also today. I will not go. Yesterday, we had a very nice conversation in a, in a meeting regarding um, the in inequity, the actual inequities um, uh, which has been. But just to be short, I'm working on the documents for the G20. and. Uh, one of the documents, the most important one, I think, one of the most important one, except the final declaration of uh, Mario Draghi on October 31st, is a, a, is a document that describes an initiative led by the Ministry of Finances. What we helped these guys from the finance and the health minister and the prime minister office is to melt the, um, the, 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 the best of the three panels that uh, the, put forward a report, the IPPR, and Mark is here, and um, the high-level financial 
you know that there is a high-level financial panel that was uh, convened by the Ministry of Finances and the Monti Commission. Because the Monti Commission, of course, we, I really look forward to have this. I already I speak often with Mario Monti, but uh, we need to have this report out because really we, we have been able to, uh, to, to put the best from all these previous reports or actual reports in a document that actually for preparedness, although I still say that, uh, be careful, uh, the problem is also today. Uh, uh, we need to pre be prepared, but today is the problem. Um, we are trying to, in a sense, have a linkage between the health and the finances. Uh, to do what? The proposition is to have a fund uh, to have money to respond to the current one at the moment. One thing that with Mark and Peter Sands we discussed many times, and I'm closing here, is that actually we need not to reinvent too many wheels. Uh, my One of my suggestions was to, at least for some parts of the preparedness, let's use what has proven to be effective, like the Global Fund. The Global Fund is in the regions, is with the people, knows the countries, has an accountability system. Of course, we cannot divert resources for TB, malaria, and, and, and HIV, but a part of the work that the Global Fund is actually doing, and if he is, um, let's say, uh, funded more, he can do a lot of what is preparedness at the community level and at the health system level, locally. Uh, it's not by constructing a new board or a new fund that we will uh, uh, overcome the present and the future pandemics. Thank you very much, Stefano. Um, Martin, I want to go get back to you in something because throughout this uh, day and even in this panel, we have heard pandemic preparedness and global health security used in, in the same context. And in some uh, uh, situations, they're used interchangeably. So is there a consensus about what pandemic preparedness and global health security is? I don't think that there is, um, you know, my inspiration in much of health policy is um, an English writer, uh, Lewis Carroll, uh, who wrote Alice in Wonderland, and in that one of the characters said, words mean what I choose them to mean, uh, and that uh, has helped me throughout uh, all of uh, my career. Uh, so I think that, that it is always necessary to try to define this, and this is one of the problems that we face. Um, and uh, you know, going back to the, my comment about the global financial crisis, where you have, and the, and the need for anthropology, um, where you have tribes who use terms in their own communities, uh, and just another example, where, which we looked at some years ago, universal health care, universal health coverage. They're essentially the same, but they're used in different scholarly communities. Uh, so I, uh, I'm sure others will be able to put me right on this, perhaps. But uh, I think that I think in all of these things, we should start off by saying what we actually mean. I suppose one of the things is that pandemic preparedness is a subset of global health security because. Clearly, there are many, many threats beyond pandemics that we need to worry about. And uh, we have a section in our report which looks at them, drawing on the work of the World Economic Forum, for example, that have set out quite nicely a list of existential threats, uh, because they include, obviously, the ones around the both natural threats, like an asteroid strike, for example, um, or cosmic ray plumes and things like that, all the way through to all of the issues around biodiversity and, and so on. Um, so there are many, many health threats, um, threats to health security um, that go beyond pandemics. Thank you very much, Martin. Precious, in, in, your, in your initial statement, you mentioned about the importance of the involvement of communities. Um, 
but do you have any ideas of how we can improve communication between not only communities, all networks and all actors that are critical uh, to pandemic preparedness? Well, firstly, let me say that what we've established um, is that the communities have been central in, in our response. And, and perhaps at the country level, um, a, a multi-sector response and interagency response is extremely important. But it cannot just stop at, at country level. It needs to be cascaded up to regional and global level. And for most of the structures that we've seen where there's governance arrangements that involved communities in a form of uh, representation or participation, we have found those to be very effective. We can cite the Global Fund as one, Unit Aid is another. I mean, there are multiple structures where we've seen these kind of arrangements that have been shown to work. There's been debates, as an example, in WHO that we needed similar participation. As you know, there's been debates about whether we need a committee C or whether we need equal representation in a multilateral system like that. My, my view is that community participation and involvement of non-state actors has been extremely important and it has become even more important currently with this pandemic. And our history of HIV in South Africa has shown how community mobilization can marshal government into responding. We've seen that also globally happen. As I speak, we still have shortcomings in structural drivers of HIV, which need direct community involvement and participation. And I'm hoping that even these governance structures that we are recommending globally, they should also reflect the interests of communities through their participation and having their voices. Like in South Africa, they always say, nothing without, nothing about us without us. Thank you. Thank you, Precious. Mark, in, in, in your... Uh... In your initial thoughts, you mentioned about the inequity in the access to vaccines, particularly in African countries. If we're thinking about a global architecture in response to pandemic preparedness, what should be the founding principle of such a body? Uh, inclusion and equity. So, you know, IPPR has re recommended that all regions participate in a governance structure, um, not just the wealthy countries, not just G20 plus a few token, uh, you know, G77 countries, but all countries. Uh, and the inclusivity is to include the private sector and communities, which are the most, the communities being the most important, as Precious has just said. And really, if you look at the countries that responded well in the early days, and we conclude this in IPPR when I think the most intensive analyses of 24 countries, some that did well, some that did poorly, some in between. Uh, the key was having a multi-sectoral, across multidisciplinary, and including communities and private sector established system that could respond uh, when necessary. So the, that inclusivity and the equity is essential. Um, and really the, We've made this case before, but it's never been the case until this one. You can't win in a global pandemic if everyone doesn't have access. Mu is, is a, the existing uh, Delta variant came about because there was, wasn't was vaccine access in India. And so the, the virus likely mutated against the natural immune response. Um, mu and the, the variants that are going to emerge, again, that will be resistant to all vaccines, will emerge where vaccine rollout is slow including perhaps in the United States, but we already have it in, in Peru. So you can't have virus ping-ponging between vaccinated and unvaccinated people. Equity is actually self-interest um, as well. And I know that's uncomfortable to say and uncomfortable for those of us who want equity for the sake of equity, but we need that understanding in order to move resources. So, you know, um, equity, 
and inclusivity are the major principles. And in fact, sorry to intervene, we do not, we do not have an Icelandic uh, variant, correct? Not yet. <laughs> not not yet. yet. No, but I'm saying that to follow your reasoning, it's yeah. coming where the, the, the virus storms. Thank you to everyone. And I would like to, to end uh, the, the panel discussion with all of you answering a question in one or two minutes. What would be um, your advice for the global fund in what its positioning and finance strategy should be looking towards the seventh replenishment? Anyone can start. No, I start. No, I would say, I would say, so I, I close my mouth then. Uh, I think that uh, it's what Peter Sands said, that the global fund is fighting also COVID. Directly or indirectly. So this is the way to attract. Uh, because they, many countries will say, no, 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 now we have COVID. Uh, no, you have the global fund, which is an actor that you have to use also for COVID. Yes. That would be your advice. I, 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 I think that Global Fund has made huge investments in, in health systems strengthening, which may not necessarily be acknowledged because we've always looked at, at, at the diseases independent of, I mean, the whole, all the three programs independent of the health systems response. So, like I said earlier, we could actually learn from there that COVID could actually build on the global fund experience of building, uh, you know, health systems. But also to say that in a in a in a, in a long term, uh, the resilience that that was referred to earlier and predictability. Perhaps we need to start thinking about how every country can contribute based on ability to, to pay. I mean, I, I, I can talk about South Africa and that we, we used to also uh, uh, contribute uh, towards uh, pledges, but we also were a beneficiary as a country. In total, we paid uh, 28 million um, US dollars, but we benefited uh, 1.2 billion. So, so from that perspective, I think if we can sort of use that uh, a, a culture of replenishment and also investments by country, every country, no matter how small they are, that you know investing in the global fund is a necessary investment. Thank you very much, Precious. Martin. Yeah, well, it's clear from COVID and from all of the other many, as Stefano said, there are an endless number of other viruses and other microorganisms coming along. Wouldn't it be good to try to eliminate those ones that we've had around for a very long time so we can be better prepared for the ones that are coming down the road towards us? I think uh, letting the, uh, you know, it, it, letting HIV, malaria and, and TB continue the way they are, it just renders us more vulnerable for the next threat. Thank you, Martin. Sarah? Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you. I, I would argue that the Global Fund at this point should be positioning itself as a model for funding health in general and for really addressing what we mean to move health beyond the, the conversation and the discourse of health, meaning treatment of disease to health, meaning promoting resilience across society so that everybody gets an equitable chance to live a, a, a life of well-being and good health. Um, and then finally, I would say, if I, if I was uh, really giving a piece of advice to the Global Fund, having looked at uh, across those 150 organisations, that it's time for somebody to make the really ma radical move of moving themselves out of Geneva, New York and London and actually situating themselves in situations where they're actually able to talk to, network with and interact with the communities that everybody's talking about. So I would say put some of that money into moving house. Mark, 
what would you have to say to the global fund? Um, well, unfortunately, sir, the Constitution doesn't allow that. <laughs> um, what the Global Fund does have is CCM, country coordinating mechanism, but we're the only ones that really have them. So the way I would position it is, first, the Global Fund is already one of the organizations deeply engaged, uh, $4.5 billion allocated, uh, unlike many other agencies, and has done quite a good job. So make the point about how well the Global Fund has already done. Secondly, it's going to need to be engaged, or some organizations are going to be need to be engaged going forward to procure all the other, the non-vaccine stuff, uh, which the Global Fund has been doing uh, quite well. Uh, and then when we have treatments available, to get the treatments available. The third relates to what Sarah just said. Communities have to be involved, and it, we have to have the SNIDIS, the center of activity in the countries linked to regional and global. And the Global Fund has a pretty good story to tell there with the CCMs. Now, look, there are problems with how the Global Fund engages with communities, no doubt about it. We've had it all along, but at least we try, and at least there's a mechanism, and it works better than anyone else's. Um, and the last piece is sustainability, that if you're going to not only end this pandemic, but prepare for the next one and maintain the systems that are necessary to do that, why not save lives while you're doing it? And in many countries, the only way to maintain those systems is have them actively involved in dealing with health issues today on a broad basis, including communities with all the advantages the fund has. So, but not in an aggressive way, just to be clear that there's a role here and um, uh, it's an excellent mechanism if people want to use it. Thank you very much, Mark. And thank you to everyone. Apologies if I rushed you a little bit but it's been a great conversation. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Erika. <laughs> Martin, you stay. You stay on the stage. Uh, well, we were supposed to have an intervention now uh, from Richard Orton, the editor-in-chief of The Lancet, unfortunately. We've been informed that, for personal reason, is not going to be able to join us today. So I suggest that uh, we we move forward to before bringing this uh, this conference to a conclusion. That uh, we allow some time for Q and A with uh, uh, with the audience. And for this purpose, I invite Martin to come back <laughs> on stage. Uh, uh, Susie, Suri, Christoph, and Michelle was going to run the show for this next stage. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Laurent. Um, and I, I'd like to make sure that uh, all of the speakers. Uh, uh, who have been online in the first and second panel uh, can still be there. I see Stefan, uh, Shannon, um, and let's um, let's now enter into questions and answers. Um, I, I was really fascinated this afternoon by this progressive and very interesting shift from looking at AIDS, TB, and malaria to the future, and this whole concept of looking at, at the th four pandemics together uh, in view of the next replenishment of glo the Global Fund, how that sort of bridged the conversation between uh, the HIV, TB, malaria part and the pandemic preparedness part. Uh, a lot has been uh, said, models proposed. Um, I think Peter's, uh, Peter Sand's remarks also helped bridge all of these topics together. As Mark Daibon uh, mentioned, uh, three of the uh, panelists or, um, of today and people heavily involved in HIV, TB, malaria, and Global Fund were actually members of the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response. So the, the, I can see the, uh, the things coming together. Uh, is that your view and your impression in the audience and online? And would any one of you like to ask a question to our panelists? 
The floor is open. Yes, please. Let's, let's first take a question from the floor here in Geneva, then I'll turn to people who are online, and then back to the audience here in Geneva. Thank you. Hello. Um, I would like to ask Mr. Martin, you spoke about two points, the health-wise and the commercial one, which is corruption. Can you elaborate and give your point of view about the second, because you spoke briefly about it. Martin? Yep. Okay, so in, in our report you will see that we have a, a long list of things that make health worse, and they include the commercial determinants. There's a growing literature on this. Obviously the tobacco industry, but also the alcohol industry, the junk food industry, the gambling industry, some elements of the chemical industry, asbestos and others, and all, all of which use the same methods. They use the same public relations companies, they use the same narratives. Um, and of course, the, their actions um, lead to the chronic non-communicable diseases that leave people vulnerable to infectious diseases. We know that people with diabetes, with cardiovascular disease have suffered most during the pandemic. So that's one part of it. And I think we need to bring that body of work, which has been growing over recent years, into our overall model of health. But there are other areas too. Corruption is uh, a major factor. Transparency International reports consistently find the health sector to be the most corrupt in countries across the world for lots of reasons, because many of the transactions take place in private they're not visible and so on. We're, we're doing quite a lot of work on that at the minute um, in um, projects in a, in a number of countries. Uh, but it's not just low-income countries, it's high-income countries too. And we really have seen the most appalling abuses of millions, many, many millions of dollars, pounds, euros uh, being spent during the pandemic. And, and of course, the corruption often means that your surveillance systems, your resilience of your health systems is undermined. The money that should have been invested in health facilities didn't get there. But then there's another area uh, that I, I would add into that. We, we deal with these separately in the report, and that is organized crime, uh, which is different from corruption in some ways, which is also a driver of poor health and one that has not been adequately recognized. You know, it is the... Um, manufacture of counterfeit medicines, for example. Um, it is the production of uh, spare parts that don't work. Um, it is uh, a whole series, range of things. So I, I think all of those need to be looked at. In one of our recent papers, we draw an analogy between the Me Too movement and corruption, because for a long time, corruption was something that we didn't talk about in polite company. And it's something that I think in the health sector we really do need to put at the forefront now and, and consider it because we have seen so many abuses. Thank you. Let me turn to um, our audience online. I have no way of controlling anything here. So uh, could you just speak out? Is, does anyone have any questions from the online audience? Well, what do you think? Let's go back to the audience uh, here in Geneva. Yes, please. Could you be kind in introducing yourself? Yes, of course. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting exchange. My name is Derek de Stockalper. I work for the Canalytics think tank. And I want to rebound on a comment from Mr. Ben uh, regarding technology. And I was wondering whether technology could bring a more inclusive and decentralized health systems. In doing so, maybe the Global Fund could be a vector to drive certain approach. And if it's the case, do you have maybe some examples of steps to go in that direction? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Christoph. <coughs> and could yep. you also elaborate a bit on how we need to uh, bridge the, the digital gap? Right. I do indeed think that um, the digital uh, technology has this potential um, to build more inclusive, transparent, participatory health systems. Because it does put, maybe for the first time, potentially, you know, tools into the hands not only of 
you know, community health workers, but in the sense of the communities itself, you know, and that they have, will have access to information on health that they never had before. It had to filter down, in a sense, you know, from ministries and so on through the health system to the people. Um, and there are other tools, you know, like connected diagnostics and so on that can really be used at the kind of grassroots level. So I think the potential is there. I don't want to pretend for a second that there are no challenges with that. I don't want to pretend that, you know, we have the connectivity, that we have the tools, that we have to, the regulations, there are risks to digital transformation as well. So I'm not naive when it comes to that. But I do believe in the potential, not only to make health uh, systems more efficient, make investments like those from the Global Fund more efficient, but really make them to reach the communities and you know, have the communities participate in decision-making and information sharing. So that potential is there, but, but we now need to kind of really make sure that it materializes and that we also address the kind of risks that, that are coming with that. But um, that's why we need organizations like the Global Fund and others to really also look into that, take that as a kind of priority, invest in that, only then can we hope to maximize the benefits that, that you know, could be there. Thank you. Another question from the audience? Yes, please, thank you. Thank you, Tamara Audat from uh, the Global Health Center here, actually. Um, I think it, it, it's fascinating because uh, um, the interpretation of things from the angles. I come from uh, 20 years of working for the humanitarian sector, including 10 years in MSF. And um, uh, when you talk about the crises, the 9-11 and the financial crisis and the COVID, obviously the COVID is significant, but uh, they're significant to us now, but they, they aren't the crisis, the war and terror that was used 9-11 as an excuse and the massive bailout of the same people who lost, who caused the financial crisis rather than the, you know, the gamble that was done. And if that's a sense, then isn't part of the crisis now the collapse of any pretense of solidarity the moment a crisis affects the West in a way where they start competing for the resources? So, in, in a sense, what we're sitting here is talking about the old aristocracy the diseases that have gotten, gotten six replenishments and, and the seventh, and there's no criticism in that. They, the incredible work that was done is, is amazing. But freaking out about the next aristocracy, the COVID and uh, the global health security, taking the money away from them. And in that, we're convincing ourselves that it's about community, when there hasn't been a single mention, for example, of childhood illnesses, of sepsis, of pneumonia, of diarrhea, of the things that are killing equally large numbers of, of uh, people. How are we going to go forward towards not only the COVID and similar issues, but the coming consequences of climate change, the change in the, in the endemicity of diseases, and the um, migration, the hunger, the failure of crops, all of them will probably dwarf any health crisis we see now when we are unable to hold the narrative that um, goes beyond saying communities, communities, communities with no mechanism that takes the donor of power just a little bit and allows communities to actually own the um, decision beyond uh, symbolic representation. What do you think is a governance, like a foundational, actual governance change in the system that would, would make any potential of that equality or that change possible? Thank you. Maybe, Christoph, could you be first on this? I mean, we uh, have been talking about the Global Fund model and uh, the inclusiveness from, from the start. Um, Taman, if I understand you, well, the, the, your, your last point was about how to make community representation fundamentally, um, I mean. How do, how do we not just recycle the government donors giving money to a Western based organization with symbolic representation? Right. Into something that looks fresh again? 
Right, but I, I don't think that has been the way uh, the Global Fund has been working. So let, let's have Christoph respond first, then uh, Suri, and okay, let's let, you, let, let, and let, let me, me see, is there anyone uh, on the panel? Mark, uh, will you wish to react? Yes, okay. And anyone, please signal yourself. So I don't pretend that I have a great answer to your question, but I do believe that you're raising at the end of our discussion here a very important point that we have not really touched upon, and that is, you know, global governance for, you know, challenges like the pandemic. And we've talked about the, the model of the Global Fund Board and governance, you know, at the global and at the country level with the CCMs, and that has been a huge kind of improvement and innovation, I would say, at the creation of the Global Fund. At the same time, I think we need to think again now about feasible governance models that not only, you know, make sure that there, there are governments, private sector, civil society represented, um, but we have a challenge of making sure that the kind of global community is really represented in, in a kind of effective way and in a representative way. And the Global Fund Board is, is not perfect in that sense either. The kind of you know, constituencies representing the donors and only part of the donor community and potential donor community, the lack of engaging emerging economies and, and countries that, you know, you know, are not really included in that decision making is a challenge for the Global Fund, but I think even more for, for many other organizations. And the question, who will now make the decision on whether there should be a kind of new fund, Global Health Threats Fund or Pandemic Preparedness Fund, is it the UN, is it the G7, is it the G20? What kind of body will make that decision as as much a kind of you know, challenge as the question, what will be the decision? And we are lacking, I think, instruments with that kind of legitimacy. So I think that is really something that, that we collectively need to address in this next phase as we are thinking about how the world can be better prepared for these future challenges. I mean, I know that the IPPPR and, and also the G20 Halo panel are making recommendations there. I think these you know, recommendations on global kind of boards, um, as was mentioned at the highest level, is an important step in that direction. Yeah, if I can say just one no, hold, thing. Hold on, Stefano. Let's, uh, yeah. can I just call on Suri, then Mark, then yourself, okay? Thanks. I think um, just two, two uh, quick points in, in response to this conversation. One is that I think ultimately those who decide on the creation of something like a global health threats fund or to replenish the global fund uh, for HIV, TB and malaria are governments at the end of the day, uh, not the UN and not the WHO and not the G7. I mean, it's, it's governments, not intergovernmental groupings. And if we look at the history of the global fund, it has been over 95%, I believe, and, and one of the uh, EDs can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's been over 95% public money. It's been yeah. government, not from the private sector, not from philanthropy. So it's really up to government. And I think one thing that we may have lost sight of in this discussion, and I see some of my students are here, when we talk about development assistance for health, what we, what we begin with is how big a role does this actually play in health spending at national level? And one of the big changes over the last 20 years is that it is much, much smaller than it used to be. And that uh, you know all of development assistance for health is only, um, it, it is a, a very significant source of funding in the low-income countries, but for lower middle-income countries, it's already down to only uh, one to three percent of national health spending, and upper middle-income countries, less than one percent. It, it is a very, very small proportion. So where is the real money uh, in health spending? It's actually national governments of high, upper middle, and lower middle-income countries, and even in low-income countries, it's primarily domestic. And so the question of what, you know, what is it that, a that an international global fund for anything, for health, for a specific disease, for health security, what should that do, I think, has to recognize that reality. And, and I wanted to just um, suggest a little thought experiment for all of us who, are, who care deeply about these issues. What would happen, you know, picking up on Sarah Hawks' point, what would happen if you had a global fund for health, full stop, not for health security, not for a disease, for health, and you had a country coordinating mechanism decide what do we do with this money? For the low-income countries, what do we do if we have money that's equivalent to 30% of our national health spending coming from international sources, but we, as a country coordinating mechanism, 
uh, with government and civil society and private sector and all of the multi-stakeholders at national level, what would they decide? And I think in some countries, we might have the same priorities. You know, the three diseases plus emerging infectious diseases, maybe. But in some countries, maybe those would not be the priorities. And would that change the way in which resources were allocated? Would that be a way in which we could um, see uh, what the real priorities were? Very interesting point, Suri. Actually, in the health and diplomacy course, taught right here at the Global Health Center, we do have an exercise of asking that very question. That is, if you uh, do a group of people, your country X, your country Y, and you can see the very diverse way people will express priorities um, on, on health, on promotion of health, on what would be uh, the money spent on in a global fund on health. Let, let me turn to Mark. Then Stefano, uh, can we? Well, it actually, uh, it actually picks up on, on what you all just said, both you, Michelle, and Suri. So the key is as long as the decisions on how the money is spent is made globally at a global level, we will fail. Um, what we need to do is push down to regional, national, and subnational. And when we've been doing some of this work at Georgetown, actually in the communities rather than in, in, a, in an exercise. And when you get to the community level, say in a county in Kenya or in a, a city in Iswatini, and the community comes together and it's actually around HIV and HIV money, money starts getting spent on making the road safer, safer um, because of the boat to boat rider engagement. Um, money is spent on clean water. Money is spent on entrepreneurship training. Money is spent on now on uh, hazardous waste dumps in the community that are causing health problems. And that was all started with HIV as how do we reach people and you bring communities together. We call it creating communities of practice horizontally and vertically. So you have communities of practice literally getting down to the village level where we work, where people talk to each other across villages, learn from each other, and then you link that to the formal health system. And this is where we always fail. Communities are seen as separate from health, and health is seen as separate from environment and water. Um, in Iswatini, when they launched this program, they had the ministers of labor and youth they had the Minister of Labor, Youth and Sport, Education, uh, uh, Water and Sanitation, and Health, and the Minister of Finance, because they were all engaged because that's what the community wanted. And that's smart politically, too. So the, as de, if decisions are made at the community level and we can actually listen to them and trust them, and the only way that's going to happen is by having the political leaders at the local level and then the subnational and the national level linked to the regional and then to the global, we can actually have a radical change. And that's what we have failed to do. And really of all the institutions in the world today, global institu health institutions or non-health institutions, the only one I know of that has country coordinating mechanisms that tries to do that, albeit nowhere near close to effective, is the global one. Mm -hmm. Stefano. Yeah, no, but that was just a comment, but I totally agree with this. And actually, I remember when I went many times in, in one of the African countries to work on an HIV program, they were saying, hey, thanks a lot for what you are doing for HIV. But uh, Dr. Stefano, can I t ask you, we, I have a diabetes problem now in my country, and would you mind uh, taking care of this? I mean, um, is a uh, I close the parentheses. No, first of all, maybe it was out of the scope. One of my fears, now that we are constructing boards or gl global health, whatever, uh, in terms of governance, um, there is a tendency, well, what I see around, there is a tendency of taking out the multilateral organizations and getting the power into uh, uh, another part of global health uh, advocates, let me say, that are a lot private. They do good things. They are philanthropic or whatever, but there is this tendency of 
going a little bit away from what, whatever is multilateral. So in a sense, the Global Fund, despite the issue that was re reminded about the board, which is not equitable at the end, um, in a sense is a multilateral uh, organization. Uh, but uh, th there is a tendency towards other, let's say, not, not institutions, because they are not institutions, but other actors that are mainly private. It, it was just what I feel around. Thank you, Stefano, for that comment. Um, yes, we, thank you. Michelle, One, I could sorry, jump in. I just wanted to clarify something as important in yep. case I yep. misunderstanding. The only HIV money used in Eswatini or Kenya in the examples I used was to gather people. All the money for the water, the sanitation, the environment, that came from other ministries and other sectors. Yep, so when yep. the community mm -hmm. was involved, they start pulling the resources from the other places. It's not all coming from one source, and that's the key to the solution. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Please. So, Katerina Bay, I'm an emergency physician and a global health student here in Geneva. And my question is on money, on funding and where the money comes from. And there are more and more uh, areas of um, public and global concern where individual people with more money than some country have a huge impact and influence. And in healthcare, I'm, talking about, I'm thinking about the Glo Mil um, Bill and uh, Melinda Gates Foundation. And I would like to have an um, opinion or a statement on that. Thank you. Uh, right, I can see the, the conversation is, is, is starting now, as it's often the case. Uh, and we're about to run short of time. So let's have several questions. Yeah, please ask your question. Um, hello, uh, I'm Melissa Coyle. I'm a master's student here at the Graduate Institute. Um, and my question was, so please excuse my ignorance for this, but um, should we eliminate the old viruses first to be better prepared for the emerging viruses? Or uh, should we put all the effort on eradicating the COVID-19 emergency so that we can uh, return to the uh, old virus, like malaria, HIV, and TB? Mm. Because these are diseases that I feel like should not be half addressed, but should, should have all the focus on it. Um, I know it's not a black and white answer, but I'm curious to hear the opinion on this. Thank you. And maybe last question. Yes, please. A vous. Yes, thank you. My question, my question also to Mr. Christoph or anybody, if you can share with us uh, your, exper your experiences or how do you see the future collaboration of the Global Fund with the other UN agencies? Uh, for example, Universal Postal Union, they have uh, uh, founded their own program for HIV, such as ILO, International Labour Organizations. Uh, IFRC, International Federation for uh, Christian and Red Cross, they have a unique worldwide network which is not only on health, but it is very efficient. Uh, WIPO, the international organization dedicated on pro innovation, worldwide intellectual property organization, who try yearly organize a symposium with WHO and World Trade Organization, and it's still just symposium, but it should be because it's difficult to convince all state members as a working group or a committee in the UN. Because Michelle has to remember the meeting when we talk about the future G20 Health Ministerial Council, and it was quickly implemented. It was easier to convince 20 states then all state members in the UN. How do you see is the collaboration with the other UN agencies? Thank, Thank you. you. Maybe, Shannon, I see you're uh, with us. Let's start with this last question. Uh, could, could, could you address it? Sure, I hope I'm getting the right question. I heard the question about the sequencing of, of COVID, everything else versus okay. you know, old diseases, then COVID. And, and I'm probably uh, echoing a little bit that said before is, um, you know, we can do some mental exercises on it, but when we go to practical implementation, I think we realize that these pandemics converge at the, at the level of communities and individuals. And what we don't want to have to do is reach people twice subsequently, you know, sequentially uh, and miss what might be a pressing concern at the time. 
um, you know, we're seeing these colliding pandemics, especially in, you know, urban areas, high density settings, informal settlements, marginalized populations, um, and in countries where there's a high HIV epidemic, that's where you see the layover. So I think um, it, it really can't be a sequencing one and then the other. It's gotta be a little bit of both at the same time. And then the more we build resiliently and strengthen these uh, systems that include the community-led infrastructure as part and parcel of that system, I think then the more prepared we will be for the next pandemic. Over. Thank you, Shannon. In one minute, could you reassure our colleague that UN agencies are actually working together on an issue like HIV? Yes, absolutely. So, of course, I have to give uh, the spiel that Michelle is asking for, the UNAIDS Joint Program, which is still 25 years in, the only joint program of the United Nations with the Secretariat to coordinate the multi-sectoral competencies and inputs of 11 other UN agencies. Um, we're still going strong. Um, in fact, there's oftentimes question raised, does the world still need a UNAIDS? Um, can't we just do it ind independently? But I would say that the efforts that are put into coordinating across the UN systems, not just at global level, but very importantly at regional and country levels, I think when done well, add a lot of value. But they're not, um, they don't come without investments. Coordination takes investments to get those outcomes and to get those efficiencies. And so I think uh, there is some coordination that happens. I would say that it's, it's far from perfect. And I think we have seen even during COVID um, some very good convenings that bring UN agencies together. Um, you know, we were part of the Secretary General's uh, uh, emergency task force on the immediate socioeconomic response to COVID. And I think that's where we see by coming together around specific, specific initiatives with specific deliverables or impacts you need to have, that's where we see the unique competencies of different agencies uh, come together and shift the package or the the impact that happens um, by virtue of that diversity. And we need to invest in more of that, but also hold accountable that the investment in coordinating of bringing these competencies of the UN together at global, regional, country level is delivering. It's delivering impact yeah. for people in the way it's intended. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Now, um, I'm afraid we, we need to close the event now. Uh, I'm just, uh, we will address your uh, question right after I'm asked to close the event now uh, here because it is, um, it is time. Um, so let me just ask Laurent to come and give some closing remarks. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you to all the panelists and to the audience uh, for the very productive and uh, stimulating discussions we have today. So now it's time to bring this, uh, this event to, to a conclusion. But before that, I'd like, yeah, I was not supposed to deliver the final words of this meeting. It should have been uh, Michel Barzac, the first president of France Europe, uh, Michel is a, is a friend of mine, a long-term friend of mine. I have uh, the utmost admiration for a commitment or achievements. Uh, I deeply regret she has not been able to be with us today, but I know that she has been able to connect and listen to our debates. And I'd like, in my name, in our name, uh, uh, to express to her a deep appreciation for her achievement uh, works and uh, tell her a very big, and from the deep of our heart, a very big thank you. The presentations and discussions we just had clearly showed that we are at a turning point in global health and in the life of the Global Fund. The global health environment is totally different today than it was at the creation of the Global Fund. Of course, 
the concept of global health, security and pandemic preparedness and response already existed in 2001, when the G8 and the UN coordinated and worked together to create this new instrument and in order to fight AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria. The concept of global common good, multilateralism, partnerships, equity, innovation still resonate. But the COVID-19 pandemic has shown how fragile a truly inclusive multilateralism is and how mistreated international solidarity is. These discussions inspire me two reflections. First, we must be proud of our collective work against AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, although we are not at the end of the road. We still have many challenges to face, especially to reduce the incidence of the three diseases and to reach the most vulnerable, discriminated, and criminalized populations. We cannot distract our efforts from HIV, TB, and malaria, and the current reflections on PPR might help us finding new ways to accelerate against the three diseases. Both objectives are complementary. We must also be proud and confident in the funding principles and operating model that have been set to rule the Global Fund. The Global Fund is a priceless instrument and a very effective one in strengthening health systems and thus it might play a key role in the uh, debate and the future uh, work for a pandemic preparedness response. Its reactiveness and flexibility against COVID-19 has shown it. Not to rely on the Global Fund as a key player for PPR to build a more effective global health environment would be a massive waste of time, energy, and money. I'm convinced that the Global Fund, with its network of partners and in collaboration with the other international organizations for health, can both go faster to bring to an end HIV, TB, and malaria, and be central in PPR. These are arguments are dear to Europe and must prevail in PPR in the same way they guide the Global Fund to go faster towards the end of the three pandemics and to effectively contribute to prevent and respond to future pandemics. I would like to thank all the speakers and participants of this conference present here in Geneva or at a distance for their contribution to the debate. Open discussions are essential to be better prepared to future pandemics and health threats. It is clear that our reflection will continue for a long time and I hope that we will provide major inputs to building together a better future. So the only things we have to do is to roll up our sleeves and to go to work. Despite the difficult situation of our world, I remain confident that we will do the best for the common good. At Friends Europe and among all the supporters of the Global Fund, we, want, we are fighters. We want really to achieve results. We are a result-oriented group of friends. But to lead a fight, you need fighters and you need people who are really involved on the day-to-day -day on the ground. And today I'd like also, as a final word and a very personal one, and also in the name of all the members of Friends Europe and in the name of all the person who had the chance to work with her, to pay tribute to Sylvie Chantreau. Sylvie Chantreau, we celebrate today the 15th anniversary of the Global Fund, of Friends of the Global Fund, and Sylvie has been the executive director from day one. So what we are today is, to a large extent, the result of the daily dedication and hard work of Sylvie. We will have certainly many occasions to tell her, to say her thank you again and again, and we very much expect she will be, uh, she will remain involved and committed to this fight. I have no doubt she will, will remain involved and committed to this fight. But today is a bit special day, and I'd like just to say a big thank you to Sylvie and to express, to make a small gesture, to say her a big thank you. It was so sad, yes.
thank you very much. I would like to say that uh, working with the Global Fund um, is an incredible adventure. And I invite all of us to be part of the Global Fund family. It's a very, very demanding family, but <laughs> it's a family that give uh, so much back. So I invite you to be part of that. And um, I'm sorry, because I think that um, this adventure is a shared adventure. And uh, I would like to share this with my team, an incredible team with my board, an incredible board. So we have re really a big family. Uh, I thank you very much. I will stay around for sure. But uh, it's, it's all these thanks are, sh I would like to share this with uh, all my friends at the Global Fund because we are very close with the Global Fund. We cannot achieve what we did without the Global Fund. It's uh, really a partnership between us and uh, so thank you very much, and I hope to see you very soon uh, to continue the fight for fighting to fight the three diseases and also to have the Global Fund part of the PPR. <laughs>